gives you credit Anything you want then you can get it Don't get scammed cause then you'll regret it You no longer gotta look pathetic Look pathetic Gives you, gives you, gives you, gives you credit Don't get scammed What you need is just a change of plans Mi gente, what is good with you? Gives <laughs> you credit. How you like the new thumbnail? Right there. That's what we're going to talk about today. Experian Credit Boost. Does it really work? Anyways, my people, shout out to all you coming through, logging on. Got my favorite Back to the Future shirt right now. Shout out to all you who uh, log on. We are doing these um, podcasts every other Monday, but this Monday we couldn't do them. So we're doing them today, Wednesday. Anyways, my people, bendiciones to you all. Hello, mi gente. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, does Experian Credit Boost really work? Uh, if you see from my uh, YouTube channel, let's, let's show you guys. Uh, okay, I'm scheduling a call right there. Here is my uh, Instagram where a lot of you uh, catch me and have caught all my credit repair results. And of course, you go to my Breakthrough Business Concepts, which... I will eventually post this video there and share it. Uh, this is last week's, um, last time uh, we did our podcast. This is the credit repair results video. As you could see right over here, we are, well, let me refresh this so we can see, if we can see each other right now live. Uh, but anyways, just wanna say thank you. Uh, see right there, I got two people, uh, I mean two um, videos on. I got a couple of people watching there. And uh, listen, if you want to continue seeing more of these videos, just go uh, hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't have to miss any of our videos I'm showing you guys all our social media because this is a commitment business and we do want to show you that we are constantly working and constantly putting people in position to refinance their vehicles, which is right here. And of course, educating people on how they could better themselves with their credit, be able to get whatever it is that they want from their credit as well. So let me get John on the phone right now. We do this real quick. I know sometimes I say real quick and it ends up being two hours, two hours and a half. <laughs> Let's do this. Let me see. Let me see. There we go. Right there. Let me know if you could hear John as well. All righty. Pretty soon, we're going to be able to see John on the podcast as well. Hello. What's going on, John? Hey, what's up? Good. How you been? Good. That's Good. great. That's great. Your kids in school? Who's in school? Who's not in school? No, they started school. They're not in school. I told you I started them. I didn't send them in, so I did it from a distance. So his, my son's school was able to, was able to do it distance. Mm. They, gave, they gave you the option, which one you wanted to do. And I was like, nah, I ain't sending them in yet. The yeah. ironic part, though, is this is the third day of school, and my son's class already half of the kids have switched from in school to distance learning, which is almost half of them, which is insane. That's crazy because I spoke to my my good friend. He's in New Jersey, Morris County, and um, his eight year old is going to to regular school. Like they only have two cases in his town of COVID, and nothing else. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, man. I honestly, I, I don't even know if any of these schools or anything are really tracking it. Any, I mean, you see it on the news. You see people that are cognizant of it. I, like I said before, my son's school, since he's, they started Monday, and a number of kids since Monday to Wednesday have switched from in school to to distance learning. I, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't talk to their parents. So I don't have a clue, but I mean, that's, that's, that's a real quick turnaround time, right? I mean, that's a, that's a lightning quick scenario. I guess every situation is unique to the parent and to the situation, but, um, you know, I, I just, I, 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 I don't even know how you can expect this. My son's nine, so and my oh. daughter is four, so I don't even know how you could expect to get kids to separate properly. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just, it's crazy. It's, it's insane. So, and at his school, they're still doing recess and lunch. And I mean, it's they're really not. 
you know, I mean, they're, they're claiming that they're doing all this, you know, precautionary measures, but I mean, I, I don't know how you can do that when you have two recesses a day, you have lunch, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know how you can really, you could really be doing that. So I'll, I'm not going to chance it. I'm going to let it ride out until, until there's. Do you clear, actively you know, know anyone who has gotten it? What's that? Do you actively know anyone who has, who has had it? Um, I think, I don't think so. Which is unusual because I'm in Florida and, it, you know, it, it was, and obviously I have a lot of people up and I mean, I have a lot of clients all over the country. So it is ironic that I, that I have, and I don't, I mean, not anybody that's, not everybody that's told me about it, but you know, people are real quiet about it. You know, I mean, it's yeah. got a bit of a, it's not like people are out broadcasting it, right? Like yeah, that they have it or true. anything like that. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's developed a stigma you know, that, that over the course of time where people just don't want to talk about it, you know, if they did have it. So I haven't personally been told that anybody that I know has it. Um, I'm grateful for that, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that means that everybody I know didn't have it, you know, I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, you're not on social media, but the people I see on social media, I mean, some families, everything has been, you know, death after death after death. It's crazy. Hey, well, listen, it, and again, I mean, the impact is profound. It's everywhere, right? So, I mean, you're talking about a situation where, and and here's the crazier part, right? The crazier part is we're getting into, at least up north, you guys are going to be getting into flu season come a month, right? <clears throat> towards towards October, the days shorten. People, it starts getting colder. Oh, it starts already. It's already kind of cool at nighttime over here. Right, but it really starts to kick in in October, right? Yes. Like, you know, around Halloween, it'll start to, you know, it'll get dark around 5, 5.30, and then it'll start getting cold when everybody gets inside, and then flu season starts to heat up. Here's yes. the problem, though. The symptoms that you would see from a cold, from a flu, all the stuff that percolates during that period are the exact same symptoms of corona, right? Yes. So people are gonna people are going to be losing their mind. They're going to get a cold because they're in school or they're stuck inside and they're doing whatever else. And they're going to think it's Corona when in reality, it's probably just a cold. So it's going to cause some degree of hysteria, just a confusion, right? Because the yes. symptoms are just so vague relating to, to Corona and they encompass so many different things. And, and none of it is, is individual or specific to it that you could identify, right? Uh, on mm -hmm. a broad sense. So it's like, it's going to, it's going to trigger hysteria. It's just, it's, it's going to happen, right? I mean, the flu season is flu season. Um, so I, I just think that's going to probably trigger some craziness going into the last quarter, but we'll see. I mean, I hope not. I hope we don't see. It, well, you, it, you but I mean, I think I think it's inevitable that you know we'll see some stuff. I know some places are heating up again. So without a vaccine, it doesn't ever fully go away. So it's always going to be present, right? You said come November or Black Friday that we will see the ramifications of what it's done in the last six to seven months. Since well, started. I said that I said that it'll probably you'll probably have towards towards I didn't say Good Friday, but I said towards the not uh, Good Friday. Um, but after Black, Black Friday, Black, yeah. So I, I said towards the end of this year, from from that period towards the end of the year into early next year, you'll probably start presenting some buying opportunities. Is what I think. I think that's when you'll start to see things. Because look, right now, I mean, it, 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 you know, I mean, the stock market's inflated, the real estate market's inflated. There's no yields anywhere, you know. I mean, it, we're effective. I, I mean, you see some things in the stock market just running away. I mean, it's yeah. gotten to the point where people can't even justify some of the individual stocks, like Tesla. I mean, forget about it. it's not even worth talking about. I mean, you talk to the smartest guy on Wall Street, everybody's looking with a puzzled look, like nobody can justify it. There's no, there's no multiplier or 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 formula that that can arrive at the value that that, that Tesla has gotten to. Apple, you can you can you can put numbers in a certain criteria based upon their existing base of, 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 of individual, you know, clients and consumers. And, and, and you can get to that number somehow. I mean, you're pulling forward numbers, meaning you're playing off of 2022, 2023 numbers, which is not good for a stock, but you can get there. There's no way you can get there with Tesla. Not, I mean, without speculating 90% of the stuff. So when you see stuff like that, I mean, coupled with just the massive hysteria that's going on everywhere, just blind buying of everything in a market where, like we always talk about on these, there's just unemployment. I mean, every week, I mean, we're going to get another unemployment um, update Friday. Um, but every week, the unemployment claims are like a million. Yeah. You know, the, 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 new, the new claims are like a million a week. So, I, I mean, it's... it's it, 
you know, without without employment, you, you can't have a full economy. And without a full economy, we don't get back to January. It just doesn't happen. So this this early adrenaline that's burning off right now will eventually subside. So I think you'll probably start to see that work itself into the system towards the end of this year and into next year. And then it'll probably continue to graduate out because, I mean, they're being until the problem gets fixed, you have the problem that exists. And I think there's a totally different mentality that exists now in society, right? Just broadly speaking among consumers about spending and stuff. I mean, used car yes. sales are through the roof right now. Correct. Right? You know, it's the one, it's the one logical fundamental thing that you're seeing that the consumer do right now, right? Is, is go out there like, we're not going to use car. We're going to get a, we're going to use car. And they're, the used cars are, are, are killing it right right now. Um, because people are like, not only can you get a deal, but it's, you're going to get a nice car for a cheaper price, right? They're being more intelligent about it. On right. the other hand, then you have people overbidding for properties on low inventory. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a conundrum. Um, I know the house sales represent a much smaller percentage than the car sales right now, just because of the fact that um, a car is much more accessible as far as purchasing and the funding's there and the financing's there. You don't need to be natural. You know, I mean, people lie on their applications for autos all the time. There's no verification. So you can get a car even when you're unemployed. Obviously, when you're getting a house, that, that becomes a problem because they're full duck. So, um, right. but yeah, I gave a long answer to a short question. I, I do think towards the end of this year, into the last quarter, you're going you're gonna to see stuff. I mean, just look. I could talk about this for hours, but I mean, just look at the just look at the how many retailers are gone now, man. I mean, it's crazy. I was I was doing I the math. Lord and today. Taylor is no longer going to be available. It's I mean, Lord Taylor is fully liquidated. I mean, they're done. They're not even trying to come out of liquidation. They've decided to liquidate. They're done. It's an, it's a, it's a done store. They're not even trying to restructure. They're liquidating it. They're calling it a day. You know, they're doing it Toys R Us. They're done. That's it. Um, you know, you go down the list, though. I mean, you got J.C. Penney's, uh, which has always been a problem, and it's understandable. But you know, you work your way all the way. Neiman Marcus has issues. All these big. I mean, uh, there's a mall down here. Um, I, I know I was talking about City Place before, but there's also a, a mall out in the area of Wellington, which is out west from downtown. And okay. huge mall, right? Huge mall, big mall. Um, which is, you know. Uh, f What's the word I'm looking for? It is it is anchored. There you go by a bunch of retailers, which I'm um, like huge department stores, which at that time were Macy's, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus. I was over there on Sunday, um, Saturday, Saturday, and they're all gone. I mean, they even took their signs down. You know, they, they, well, they took their stuff down. So you, the how only about all that open, inventory? Because um, Lord and Taylor, don't they have a a uh, like a like a, a warehouse type of place or? Or, uh, you mean like a rack, like a like yeah. a like an outlet? Correct. Yeah, I don't I don't think even uh, Lord and Taylor does. Uh, Nordstrom definitely does, and that's where they're making their money, and that's what they're transitioning over to, right? Um, in an effort because they're making a lot of money there. But no, Lord and Taylor didn't. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, the, almost every other than other than um, Macy's, they were all gone, gone, gone. I mean, just not even there anymore. So you can't even use that entrance to get into the mall. They, they took their signs down and just gone. I mean, you go through the mall and half the place is actually open. The other place are cleaned out. I mean, it's just it's disturbing when you see it. I mean, I'm not making joke of it. I'm, it's disturbing to see, right? So when you see all this other stuff economically that's going on, you know, it, it, it's like, come on, man. Like, I, I know that everybody looks at the indexes because they see the indexes, you know, the, the, the S&P goes up, the Dow goes up, et cetera. But what a lot of people don't understand, which is unfortunate, because now you have so much new money coming in that don't understand the stock market. They, they, they are weighted in concentration, right? So if you're a yes. larger stock, for instance, Apple, and you carry the largest concentration within, for instance, the Dow, which they do, when they move up, the Dow moves with it, right? And the larger that they get, the more of a concentration that they get. So that's why you've seen the Dow constantly go up, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the ones that used to be bigger, like Boeing, have now shrunk their concentration in the Dow and subsequently the move, their moves down get obliterated by Apple's moves up. Does that make sense? So when you see, when you see the indexes going up in the stock market, it's because a couple stocks are moving. It's not because the whole market's moving. I mean, today was a broader market move, but okay. for the last month and a half, it's been completely carried by a handful of stocks as it's pushed this and people look and they're like, Oh, it's up. The economy must be great. It's like, no, no, no. Another couple companies, Boscov's filed for bankruptcy. You know, every week it's like three more, you know, uh, huge, huge 100-year companies, right? Yes. That are filed for bankruptcy. I mean, granted, look, retail, the onset of all, all that this did was just accelerate um, 
all this COVID did was just accelerate, was probably on deck for retail anyway. They didn't make the necessary adjustments. It's just, it, that's a lot of jobs, right? That's a lot of jobs that don't require uh, an education, like a, a, a higher level education. You understand what I mean? Like you don't yes. need a college degree to go work at the, at the perfume counter over at, over at Bloomington's, right? So it's like you, you're vacating, and if you figure, you scale it out all across the country, you think, you know, obviously, J.C. Penny, call what you want, or, or, or Lord & Taylor, they have a big presence. I mean, I don't know what their global employment was before this happened, but it was probably significant, right? You figure all those jobs are gone, right? And a lot of those, those jobs where there's not an educational requirement to get in are a lot of the ones being obliterated, right? And, and it's like you say to yourself, well, how is that individual going to get employment again? How are you going to yes. get them back working again? Right? And, and the answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows. And there's no measures being taken to assist with that. So, I mean, I think, I think everybody can agree that, that, that there's no, you know, that any stimulus that comes out from this point forward, if there is any, which I think is a giant question mark, is probably going to be diluted. I mean, I said last time when we did the last stimulus, they were getting dangerously close. They were getting like a danger zone. You know, as far as borrowing, because they lend against, they effectively use the GDP as a parameter to lend, to, 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 not, I don't want to say lend, but to, okay. to, to provide the stimulus against, right? And I mean, they were pushing five, six trillion dollars. I mean, we're at 22, 23 trillion dollar GDP. So you're running almost 30%, right? I and mean, that's a big number. So you got to ask yourself, how does that get paid back? And we've already talked about this. I mean, there's only certain ways government can get money, right? Yes. And taxation is the obvious, lowest hanging fruit and the most obvious and, and the most prolific of them all. So that would mean they'd have to tax. And I just don't think that they probably think that there's a real possibility. I mean, I heard a senator talking a month ago, and they said they've accounted for about half of the money that they've put on the street so far, yes. meaning they think they can get it paid back, right? And um, that still leaves $3 trillion, which is an enormous – number right yes. that you don't have accounted for which means you're gonna have to figure out a way to finance it through taxation over the course of however long i just think um i just think i i, I just I, I i think unfortunately um as a as a broader um it was great to see that people are buying used cars i think that's the right response to this kind of a situation right i mean there's so many certified used cars and stuff and i think you can stretch your dial a little further seeing a lot of the other stuff is just is really disturbing because I don't. I, I think anybody that understands how this economy works knows it just does not. It does not end well. You know, it just doesn't. It doesn't. They can. There's not enough money. The Fed is one thing because they literally just print money, right? Yes. But the Fed, the Fed doesn't help. The Fed is helping large conglomerate organizations, and, and they're they're building it up. They're propping it up, right? They're propping up the stock market. You could argue that they're probably buying the futures too, which is helping because overnight you're seeing the futures move when the volume is the lightest, and it's helping to set the table for the next day. But it's a different conversation. But I mean, if you figure the fact that they can invest in large companies, nobody's here helping Main Street. Oof. Nothing. There's nothing on Main. There's nothing on Main Street anymore. There's no more the the, EI, the disaster loans expire in like a week. That's it. They're almost out of money. So literally, the money that was provided. So that 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 dream is almost gone, especially with none coming back. That unemployment thing. That's done. If, they're not going to get any of that additional six hundred dollars or whatever. That, I mean, that's gone. If that was going to happen, that would have happened before. And I think they're trying to do a wait and see approach to see if they need to step back in at a later time. They're trying to keep some 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 powder dry. But I just think that, you know, now with these things not being bolstered up again, like the unemployment, like some of these other things, you're going to start to see the ramifications, right? Okay. Without peppering Main Street, which represents a large majority of our broader population, you're going to start to see the pressures come in, right? Because – I mean, granted, they, they, they're pushing off the um, – they just announced yesterday that the eviction moratorium is getting pushed off, meaning it's, in, it's staying intact for an extended period of time again. They're is this state it. by state? Uh, no, this was a federal scenario. So, I mean, this was the government that released this. So I, I, I assume that there's – it's probably not – I mean, they could probably take it to court if they wanted to, but I, I – Well, you are – you're uh, – um, uh, what you call it? You are landlord. Not, landlord, right? How does that help you out? Uh, I mean, I'm very grateful that the tenants that I have, I haven't had that problem. I had one tenant 
at one of my properties in the very early going, try and say that. And it's not that I'm not, I'm not, uh, that I'm an, you know, an ass about it. I, I just said to them, listen, you know, we, I'm open to whatever it is you're trying to suggest. I'm open to hear whatever it is that, 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 that you want to explain and you want to kind of, you know, explain your situation and what you think is attainable uh, and what isn't. And, you know, his approach was, he was like, okay, I'll get back to you. And he got back to me about a week later and, and he found somebody else to take his room within that house and they, the other tenants agreed to it. So um, he left and that was the only issue that I had, um, fortunately, and I'm grateful for that. I think that um, that's a whole different conversation though, right? When yes. you're getting into even, even the commercial stuff. Oh my gosh. I mean, you want to talk about a beating that's just going to keep on happening. Who is going to go out now? But I thought that um, when you, uh, the overall economy is looked at is when they start going down. I mean, don't the rich feel it first before the people in the bottom feel it first? In what, in what way? Like with the, um, with the commercial properties, you know? They're going to feel right. it first so, before, so you, before but, people but in the bottom feel it. Yeah, so just... just play it back from the back end, right? A, a, a large majority of the owners of commercial properties in this country are, are real estate investment trusts, right? Yes. They're publicly traded, right? Uh, there's also individual owners, but it's not as common and they might own you know, a few here, a few there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One of the larger, the biggest mall owner in our country is Simon Properties, um, which is based in, in New York. Um, I, you know, you're talking about somebody that owns a large, significant amount of malls in this country. Um, and the fact of the matter is that these people, I, I mean, they have the ability to go to the capital markets and raise more capital, right? And this is the point I was trying to make before. They can go to the capital markets and raise more money, which can prop them up. I don't know who's going to go into a mall right now and say, yeah, man, I really want to open up a business in this place with mall traffic at like a hair. So you have to, and same with, same with on a commercial storefront. I mean, anywhere, anybody that's near commercial storefronts every day sees more and more places closing because they just can't sustain it. And there's no more liquidity for them. You know, for the last three or four months, it was great with the liquidity that the government was providing. That's gone. It's done. It was great for the people that were unemployed that were getting an extra $2,400 decided rather than saving it, put it in a Robinhood account, and blowing the account up. That's gone. That's not happening again. Now you get 70% of your best for 12 weeks. Right. And that's what you're going to get on going until they discontinue it. That's the reality of it. Unfortunately, they may step in later on in the year, but all that money that was pumped into the system at the end of the, you know, during the summer and that that was designed so that people would save, they would squirrel mm. it away. Right. Yes. And the fact that it was going to carry them over. Instead, what people decided to do is they decided to go out and buy everything with it, which is why retail this sales is, numbers were up, which yes. is why home sales were up, which is why auto sales started to eventually come back up. I saw people a picture. I saw a picture, Jay. Of, of uh, there's a there was a meme of a, of a picture of a house and it had all these Amazon packages that it was covering the entrance of the door. Like really? Yeah. No, but this is but this is this is what I'm saying though. This is and look for 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 somebody that could sustain it. That's fine, man. I think that's you spend however you want to spend your money. But if you were somebody that's home and your career and your life was was in question at that point, meaning like your livelihood, your financial livelihood, yes, I'm not sure going out and and, and spending frivolously was is probably the wisest thing to do, right? And I'm not trying to judge anybody. I understand sometimes people going through hard times, spending money and going out and experiencing things can take your mind off it, right? Correct. And it can. It can it can it can get you through that period, but the problem is all you're doing is kicking the can because now you're gonna have to and you're coming into a, a tough period, right? Especially if you're in the northern part of this country or in some of the areas that get cold, because you get stuck in the house and that's already a depressing depressing state, right? When you yes. get stuck in the house, it gets dark early, the sun doesn't ever come mm. out, and if it does, it's like once a week. The other days it's raining, some days it's snowing. You know, it, it becomes a, a, you know a very difficult environment to exist in. So when you pound that on with all the other things that are going on it's just it's going to make it very difficult going into the end of the year i think and into early next year because that's when the reality i think is going to set in i think there's a small we, we've we've lived on hope as a society um especially the uninformed have lived on hope as far as as a society since may right april may because they thought at first it was gonna the, the, the virus wasn't gonna you know it was it was going to pass and, and we were going to come but then it was the government's going to help drop it up and all these things are starting to disappear and now it's just you're at brass tacks you know if, if you're somebody that worked at macy's 
and 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 you and you may may or may not have an education of limited degree, and I'm not judging anybody that does. The problem is, is that if that was your specialty, that that specialty is now gone, right? I mean, what do you? What, everybody's going to cram into Macy's. Macy's just said they're cutting back, right? They've my sister, my sister back. works for Bloomingdale's. Okay, there you go. And right? you go into that Bloomingdale, and the thing about it, Jay, is that they they remodeled it. I mean, it is it is in Bergen County, and some places in Bergen County, I mean, when 2008, 2009 happened, all the way to 2012, Bergen County didn't really feel anything. You know what I'm saying? There were still people purchasing. Well, I think I think everybody probably felt that the problem Correct. is, is that it, 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 if you have a little more money to fall back on, you're in an affluent area and, and, you, and you're yes. fiscally wise in how you're administering that during times like this when you're preparing, you're going to you're gonna feel it a little differently than somebody that's not prepared for it. Maybe doesn't have the same back bone to be able to sustain it. But finish your point. Go ahead. Uh, no. Um, empty. Malls are empty still. I mean, here in Jersey? No, no. But it, I mean, I think the thing that's most disturbing for me when I was explaining the story, I was talking about the malls, that they even took their signs down. Yes. This mall's been, that I, that I was explaining to you, that's been there for 25 years. This place has been there 20 years. It's been four months since the, four months, five months since the virus. They, they not only emptied them, they took their signs down. I mean, they're just blank buildings. Who's going to fill years, that place been there. You can't put Macy's in every storefront. There's no new ones propping up. They're all get, trying to either figure out a way to restructure or liquidate or do a combination of both, right? Yes. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think anybody really looks at this second, third, fourth, fifth step, right? Everybody's just on the surface, like, yeah, let's get this vaccine. Like, dude, I got news for you. And I, we talked about this in another one. That vaccine comes, it's not going to change people's psychology, this situation. Employers aren't going to turn around and be like, yeah, man, we're hiring now. We got this vaccine. Even though it's only 65%, it's only going to help 65% of the people. Let's get the vaccine, you know, you, blah, 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 blah. It's not going to happen. The people need to prepare properly. And I've been saying this for a long time. Now that the government stimulus is now starting to dry up and they're not, and they're having very a significant amount of difficulty moving forward with any of that. And that liquidity started to drop from Main Street because that was Main Street's solution, right? I'm not talking about the Fed and propping up corporate America and propping up the stock market and stuff. The fact of the matter is Main Street, the average human being, their way of staying propped up was the unemployment, which is gone. And meaning like the extra unemployment and 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 um, the extra unemployment and and the fact that wait what was the what was the other I'm losing my train of thought the uh, e idea I mean um the stimulus package oh the stimulus yeah and the and the PPP and the e idea that was Main Street right and that's all, right. all running out that's all gone that well has that well has been tapped but Jay who and, who are we to tell people um, what to do with their money. I always found that whenever we have returning customers, we try and do our best with these podcasts to educate, tell people what to do, what not to do. I mean, I just spoke to a customer today. Uh, let me see. What was his name? Um, he emailed us. Uh, Cedric from uh, North Carolina. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's a good client. I like Cedric. I know, I know. But he went and got a, you know, try to go for a vehicle. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't bring it up. I know. Listen, it, it drives me nuts. But, the, but when when that happens, because it's just unnecessary errors. But I want to go back and answer your question that you asked just now. Who are we to to give people? Yeah, who are we? Because I, let me let me finish my 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 train of thought there. Because uh, I I always was like, should, you know, I can't go and judge people who are coming back and be like, oh, you shouldn't no. have done this, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So sure. I'm like. But in reality, who are we to tell uh, to question people's hustle? We don't know if these people have two jobs, three jobs, and are doing the best to, you know, get that vehicle that they always wanted. You know, like the customers that we have, they go and get high-end vehicles. I mean, yes, they may tell us how much money they make or whatever. And but who are we to tell them? You know, that's a, that's a stupid thing to do unless their their goal. They tell us their goal, and their goal is I want to purchase a home. Then we'd be like, okay. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, do this. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I feel like, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, yes. Okay, so I feel like when it comes to um, what I'm describing right now as far as people spending money, you're talking about your livelihood. 
this isn't some this isn't some bullshit where we're in the middle of a peak economy and you're over leveraging yourself and you have the ability to go jump and get another job. I don't think I don't think the profound scenario that's playing out is really feeling in people. And I think this is what ultimately ends up happening. There's you know when you exist in a society of hope rather than fact and you and you don't want to peel away the layers to see how the economy really runs and you just hold your breath and wait for something to occur in situations mm. like this when you need to be more assertive i think that when it comes and smacks you in the face it shouldn't effectively be a surprise right so when we're trying to do these podcasts and educate people and kind of let them know so they can make their own move i'm not judging anybody listen yeah. you wouldn't be able to be i wouldn't be able to be you wouldn't be able to be in the in the business of helping people repair their credit if we judged anyone right because we would have we would have spun out the first year the first five clients because people do things a lot of times that are very self-destructive they're humans we're all humans we're imperfect people right it's what happens the the point what I'm trying to make, though, is that I don't think, and I'm not necessarily blaming the consumer because everybody's got a different level of understanding as far as finance is concerned. Yes. But I don't think it was it was it's being properly extended to people as far as what's going on, right? The, the, the media is doing a great job of, of, of pumping hope into the system, right? Yes. And everybody's hanging on this vaccine, and I just don't think the understanding of what is normalized in society. I mean, I heard today that they're doing <laughs> they're doing NFL games. Right, and which is great. I, I, you know, everybody loves the NFL, Correct. but that six of the six of the stadiums are actually bringing fans in for week one. Let me guess, I, Republican states. <laughs> I, 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 more than likely, right? More than likely. But the but the point I'm trying to make is, how does that happen? How on earth does that happen? I mean, how can you? We can't even figure out schools, but you're going to pack fifty thousand people into a stadium where the seats are six inches next to each other. I mean, it's an, even if you do every other seat, you're still. Well, what one. do you call it? Is it is it is it herd immunity? Is that is that what people say? Herd immunity? Is that? Yeah, what but is? the herd immunity has to kick in. You don't you don't you don't put them all in a in a in a in a in a pot and let them herd it out. I mean, that's not that's not the process. The herd immunity takes time to implement. But I mean, listen, I I, I do think, and I know we wanted to talk about the experience of going along the tangent, but I no, I we are, think, we are, but we like we like. Uh, to know what's going on in the economy. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I think, I think that, um, I think that it's unfortunate if they don't, which I, I don't foresee, by the way. But if they don't come out with another stimulus, and they don't give some kind of, and they know where it's going to land. I mean, it's almost like they're trying to do like a, like a softer landing for Main Street, right? Where corporate America continues to get this propping up from the Fed to be determined. That's going to mm -hmm. go on forever, right? Uh, because they can't, they, we, we, we went from a free market for a hundred years in this country to now we're effectively like a manufactured market, right? I mean, the Fed is so much in the daily activities of the bond market, the stock market, every market, the overnight repo market, every possible market can substantiate. They are now, they have their hands in, in an effort to keep this level. It's like I always said before, it's like a boat that has a leak and you're constantly trying to plug it with your finger, right? I got and the, then, I got the thumbnail up that says, uh, what is inflation because people are saying on facebook hyperinflation and inflation is gonna kill the dollar and this and that yeah but here's the problem though last week you know um j pal does a does a does a um he does a speech from jackson Hole. well not him the fed whoever the the fed chief is does a does a speech from jackson Hole every year it happens okay. you know right now it's j pal in his speech yesterday he says he's gonna let inflation run now if you go back to that podcast we did which is that this one I right over here, uh, my which, people. Which I had explained in that podcast. I said, if you go back historically to what happened in Japan and how Japan is the one that started with the money printing and everything like that, and, right. and everybody thought that they were going to be going through hyperinflation, yada, yada, yada. The reality is what ultimately ended up happening, it was it was an equaling out effect, and their inflation has effectively been flat. Now, the, the Fed governor came out uh, – Powell came out last week, made a speech that said that we're going to let inflation run. Now, if you think that they were concerned about there being a hyperinflation, see, hyperinflation was like was like the Facebook fad from like a month ago. Now you hear people talking about stagflation, which is the other direction, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like you can't really, you know, you, when you don't know what you're talking about, you just keep switching sides, right? You go with what the media tells you. It's like you have talking points that are triggered by other people rather than fact. But the reality here is that he said he's going to let it run higher. Their mandate is normally 2%, one5 percent that they want to keep inflation out. Now, this is core inflation, by the way. I mean, this isn't even real inflation. If you really, if you add in inflation associated with real estate, 
um, and other things that they don't include in core inflation, then the inflation rate is significantly higher than one and a half percent, whatever. Okay. But the reality is that that's what they do, and that's how they play with the numbers and the, and the words. But they said they're going to let it run. So if there was really a concern where he does one of his biggest speeches all year, and he says, "Listen, we're going to keep interest rates low for a long time, and we're going to let it, we're going to let inflation run, meaning they're going to let asset value, because they know that that the demand is going to go down." Yeah, and it provide it provides an equalizer for that, right? So if you let inflation run, you keep printing dollars, but the demand goes down, you have downward pressure, which is going to even out that, right? And that's their purpose for doing it. So the idea behind hyperinflation is bullshit. All that's going to all that all this over aggressive buying of real estate, all this over euphoric, you know, buying of stocks. Well, eventually the chickens will come home to roost. You know, I mean, it 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 it, it, it doesn't this doesn't continue. We're in a period of euphoria right now for what I have no idea. I don't even know how you substantiate it, but I do know that the reason it's going into the stock market is because all that money that was in the real estate market, all that money that was in other areas, sports gambling and such, right, is all yeah. concentrating now and there. So you're getting a lot more retail traders. Thank you, Robin Hood. And you're getting a lot more situations where you're getting money coming in that doesn't necessarily understand. I mean, Tesla went up on the premise that they were having a stock split. A stock split does nothing it adds no value to the stock yet it, it, it went up it, it went from 16 the day it was announced it went from 1300 to 1700 it made a 30 percent move on the announcement it does nothing for that all it does is make the stock more affordable yes so it went from when they made that announcement it went from 1380 dollars a share to close the day before to overnight they made the announcement and it topped out yesterday at what was effectively 2500 dollars a share it doubled in the course of two weeks, a stock that took 25 years to get to 300, 20 years. See, hey. what most people don't know is I, the reality is that Elon Musk did not start Tesla. You guys know that. Do you know that? Are you aware of that? I believe he bought it from someone else. He did buy it from somebody else. He bought it from two guys that started Tesla. There was two guys that, that started Tesla and he... When he sold his PayPal, because he was one of the guys that started PayPal, him and like three other guys that started PayPal. Correct. And when they sold their interest, they made a boatload of money. He started, he, he sold Tesla the company. He invested in it early. He was a large investor in it with these two guys. He eventually bought those two guys out, right? And that's how he took ownership of Tesla. He didn't start it from the ground up. Now, he's a genius. I'm not trying to take away from that. I, I, I truly believe he's the, he's the Thomas Edison of our time, right? I really do. I think that... He, you're only getting started. The point of the matter is that uh, that's how he's most known for, and that's not even a company that he literally grassroots. He just ran it up right to where it is today, which yes. obviously I, I'm not sure anybody else would be able to do to the effect. But I mean, there's no, it's it's this is just the, the the time we live in, and it's crazy to believe that you have a stock that was last year it opened the year at uh, what was it? Uh, I I think it got down to. to Earlier on this year, maybe it was down two hundred bucks. I don't remember something like that. Somebody like, will know, tell it, us. Somebody will tell us on on two hundred dollars. I believe. I think it bottomed at two hundred dollars in January. Something somewhere around that, and it caught up to twenty five hundred dollars yesterday, two days ago. Twenty. I mean, that's in one year, and all they did was have two quarters that have reflected, you know, a, a profit. It's insane. It's Some insane. People, people and got it's, that stimulus money, and they and they went to go get Teslas, Jay. Well, listen. This is why. This is why. No, it's not that. It's. It's. I think. I think it's more. I think you're probably more talking about who's buying the stock, because they said at one point the daily activity on Tesla was a twenty percent float from retail, which means that guys sitting at home, twenty percent of those moves yeah. and exacerbation of those moves were from retail traders, not institutional traders where big money is, not you know, not hedge funds, etc. They got in much earlier, so you got who gets stuck holding the bag up at twenty three fifty, right? On on the on, on on look, you'd have to pull forward from like twenty twenty seven to rationalize where it's at right now. Now it's going to correct; it's inevitable. But I just these are the types of things that are going on; these imbalances that are so out of whack for anybody that hasn't been around to witness this stuff in the past historically. There's so many things that are so out of whack right now that need to come back together, and it'll eventually come back together. And I think. Like I said, into the end of this year, into early next year, you'll start to see them start to work back to the mean. And then we'll, you know, a new economy, assuming we find footing, will start to present itself. I mean, I, I think if, if Biden wins, we'll get we'll get a natural pullback anyway. 
right? I mean, because Trump is so pro-business everything that you're basically taking the biggest cheerleader of, of the economy out of the picture. And, and that alone is going to discount, right? Correct. Not to mention a large majority of me believes that the Fed is propping this up because they're working together going into an election cycle right now. So, you know, once that election cycle completes and the Fed can't be accused of being partisan and they can get back to business, right? As Correct. far as not trying to prop up areas that don't technically or necessarily need to be propped up and more than likely are probably overinflated and bubblicious, right? Um, so I think once that happens, that'll also help to kind of alleviate some of the success that's going on in the market right now. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I, my people I know I is right over here or, or over, right, over here. Yes. Over here is the podcast that we had with real estate or stock market. What's better investment right now? If you want to check that out, uh, just go to my my uh, my channel and click on the videos about two hours plus podcast that we had answering questions and everything stocks related um but yeah i mean you know we want to have these podcasts educate you i know uh carissa tally just said love these topics great podcast guys so people love when we go into the economy real estate um stocks um but of course um you have anything else you want to say i mean we're going to eventually jump into other things during the podcast, but right now, you have anything else you want to say, or you want to get into? Um... No, I mean, I, I just think that I just think that you know, I, I repeat myself, and I've been repeating this since you know March, since we've done them, and 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 just about what to expect, and it's pretty much played out the way I've said it. Because honestly, it's it, you know, once you once you start breaking down how our economy works, and you and you extract the stimulus. Um, which effectively I was kept saying, we're still sitting at the doorstep. We're still sitting at the doorstep. Now you're taking that out and, and people are having to go out and walk on their own. Right. And we're back to normal functioning environments for businesses and so on and so forth. And the banks aren't lending. I mean, anybody that knows that, that, that knows and people that are in banking, a majority of the work that they're doing right now is mediations and mitigations on loans. I mean, they're, they're doing very little volume. I mean, read a quarterly on any of these 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 lenders. I mean, they're doing a lot of workouts right now. A majority of the volume in their time, which goes back to what Chase said in March. We talked about it on some of our podcasts there. Chase came out in March or April and made a press release and said they're not doing any more business lending through the end of the year. They said that in March. So obviously that they were anticipating that this was going to be a shitstorm, right? And that they were going to have to do a lot of workouts. And then everybody has just fallen in line because it's all in line. Because they learn and they realize that people are going to need these kinds of adjustments, right, yeah. um, a, a, in order to be able to maintain. So it takes the focus away from new loans, right? So the, the only the only business game in town, now I'm not talking about cash advance companies. I don't even know. I don't deal with any of them. So I don't know how they've survived or fared through this. I, I can't imagine. Well, they got to hustle, hustle, I, hustle, Jay. That's what it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for them, so I'm not going to. But I can tell you, just the traditional lenders. I mean, they're not. They're not putting the only. They're telling people the only game in town right now. If you need to get money, is the SBA, right? Yes. I mean, you, you talk to people in banks. They're, 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 they're but Jay, you gotta have good credit for the SBA too. But no, 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 no. The, 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 here's the thing: the SBA traditional programs are not on the table. The the EIDL, the PPP, that is the low hanging fruit. That is the cater to everybody. When you take that off the table and that's gone in the next seven or eight days, then you get to back to normal underwriting, right? You get back to normal programs. You get back to seven twenty minimums, right? You get back to you have to have the equity and collateral to substantiate the loan because that's how the SBA works. A lot of people who started credit repair couldn't get the EIDLs. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I can't speak. I mean, I know that. And, I and, and their credit score is what, a 580? It's a 575. But here's what I can tell you. I had two clients myself, other clients that own, one of them owns a fairly significant um, claims company in Miami. And he tried doing on his own. I don't know why his assistant on his own, on her own, tried submitting the EIDL, EIDL application for him. And she did it wrong. Right. All she booked was the income. She didn't back out the expenses. So it looked like he made a, a significant amount of money. Right. And they came back and said, listen, everything looks great, but you make too much money. Oof. And I'm and, and and so if you want us to reconsider it, let us know. So for the last month and I had to help them put it back together, fix it. We resubmitted it for the last month and a half. They've been fighting with them on the reconsideration. Now they just found out today. It's been a month and a half, by the way. He, today. 
he just finally spoke to somebody over there after he had to get all these different people involved because he wasn't getting calls back. And I can only imagine how many other people that are dealing with this reconsideration that are getting jerked around, right? As that as that well runs dry, meaning like the amount of money left because there's a finite amount of money, right? They they allocated a certain amount of money for this, and it's as as it gets let out, it's gone. And when it's gone, it's gone. It doesn't get refilled. So with this particular program, he's been calling, calling, calling. And everything's being resubmitted, and he's the type A candidate. I've closed, as you know, I've done this a number of these, right? So a, he, he he qualifies for a significant amount of money. He's been waiting on that because he's in the claims business, so they do claims, like insurance claims, right? Um, they're adjusters, and, and, and they have a really big presence in South Florida, and, and like they can't do anything because right now nobody can let them in their house or in their property, and the insurance companies are taking forever to pay out right now on purpose, right? This is how they do it. When they're getting a lot of claims, they slow it down. How do you slow it down? You start litigation. Mm. You question everything that comes through, right? You take your time, and then you wait for those premiums to build up. And then what happens next is going into next year, you'll start to see those premiums jack up because those premiums will help pay for all the claims that went on for the last six months. That's insurance 101, right? So he's dealing in a situation where he submitted too much or he they, they didn't do it correctly. And I can only imagine – because that's I've had that with two of my clients where we had to resubmit it and they've just been fighting since to try oh, and get them man. to make the adjustment. That's crazy. Uh, and, and ultimately get the money. And and that's the only money though, man. I mean, you can't go into there's so much uncertainty right now that your situation needs to look even for that business. Oh yeah, even for that for sure, even for that even any business right now though. Because it's it's one thing for a bank to get very small, like a runner loan for them, right? Like let's say you're a company that does a million and a half a year and you net 300000 And you come in and, you know, even in, even in a worst case, let's say you're in the claims business like him and you're making, you're clearing 300000 And you come in and you ask for a $30,000 loan, they'll probably lowball you anyway just because they still need to make money. But your business is secure, right? This is just typical banking. But – these people aren't going for small amounts of money because they can't see the future. You understand what I mean? So it's like they got their EIDL money or they got their PPP money. Now they need another holdover because things haven't changed. Oof. And there is no other holdover. And and, and into, some, and some of them end up bank, getting – Go into, a, go into a, any one of these local banks. Go into any of them. They're hmm. all contracting. And as they – like I said on many podcasts before, the banks – model their lending based on the contract the contraction or the expansion of gdp of the economy right mm, yes. so we're obviously in a contracting economy i don't think anybody can argue that the degree to which it's contracted we won't find out until january but the banks are doing what the banks always do they're contracting their lending along with it the problem is this is the worst time to do it so they could fall back on the idea that you know the sba and the government through the, the government through the sba was carrying everybody for a period of time and on those PPP loans, a lot of banks took risk in lending them out for very low interest. But most of them are paid back at this point, right? Yep. So that money's already <clears throat> been recycled. The EIDL, that's just the SBA. There's no banks supporting that or sponsoring those loans. And, and if you ended up, and if you ended up getting a um, a, a BMW electric car or a Lamborghini, forget about it. what you're gonna do. The, the guy, the Lamborghini, so that's guy, that guy's probably in jail right now, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine he's, he's stuck in a basement somewhere getting tortured. I mean, I can't even imagine the story. I don't even know who leaked that story. For anybody that doesn't know, you're talking about the guy that got the Lamborghini with the PPP money? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And then somehow somebody released a story that, 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 that you know, he did. Didn't he get in trouble too, though? I could have sworn he got in trouble for it. Yeah. I could have sworn that was the story. But, I mean, that's... Look, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's just the, the, the point I'm trying the, – the, 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 the thing I'm trying to to, to formulate here or the, the vision I'm trying to, to project here is the fact that them not providing any future stimulus is a problem, huge problem, and then the economy has to stand on its own. And great, it's great corporate America is standing comfortable, you know, these Fortune 50 or Fortune 100 companies. They're doing great, and they're propped up, and they're great. I think that's great because that, that's the foundation of our economy, right? Um, the problem is is that the other 85% of, of the economy, which is the retail Main Street scenario, I mean 
business. A lot of those businesses, a good percentage of those businesses are doing fine. A large majority of them are not, right? And you can just go in your local mall or your local strip center and see how many vacancies there are, talk to whoever else, et cetera, and look at the unemployment claims. And it's only going to get worse because there's no more money being pumped into the system. So now they have to earn. And if they weren't able to earn last month, they're uh, – I'll, even if it's a slow crawl back to reality, they still got bills to pay, right? Here it so, goes, Jay. I mean, Here it goes. Miami man got four million in relief funds, so he bought a Lamborghini and other luxury items. Reports say. <laughs> yeah, so I guarantee you, the minute they saw that, the, the, the guys, the guys probably sitting in. in he, I, I mean, I can't. I, I don't know for sure because I don't know who it is. I know you sent it to me before, but I guarantee yeah. you, whoever wrote that it went on the radar of the of the, the necessary people in an effort to make the situation difficult for them but listen I, I i don't mean to be so dire i just think that people if you if you if you allow people all life is about expectations so if you allow the opportunity for people to set and establish the proper expectation then they can do what they need to do to set up for it cool. pumping people full of hope in a situation where it's not necessary right like it's not necessary. I, I think, like I said before, I think the misleading idea is that, okay, we come up with a vaccine and then tomorrow everything goes back to normal. I I, I, I don't know how that philosophy comes into play, especially considering if you talk to any of the pharmaceutical companies, they'll say that this more than likely on the high end, the vaccine will probably only help 65% of the people, right? There'll be a large majority that won't even take it because they don't trust whoever's providing it. There's a large majority that it won't work for it's not 100% foolproof. No vaccine is, right? Some people some people don't have the ability to take that particular. They might be allergic to it. There might be any number of other things that come into play. So just knowing that there's 35 or 40% out there that wouldn't be able to get the, 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 the vaccine, it's going to make – it's going to – sit in people's minds. You know what I mean? And then with people like you, you you're not going to give your kids no vaccine. I, I, are you, you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 look, man, I'd have to, I'd have to get a lot more information on that before I was okay pumping something into my kid. I mean, I, again, I mean, they're doing everything they can for political purposes right now to yes. rush this out. You know what I mean? And, and just like with me not rushing my kid back into school, I'm not going to rush my kid into taking the, the test, the tester case. You know what I mean? The first mm. batch, it's not going to happen. But if I'm able to make determination and see that it is, I mean, I, I just think, I think that this is going to be, and I've said this before, anybody that does research on the Spanish flu back in 1918, same thing. It's almost an identical response and almost it, it, it attacked our society almost the identical same way. The Spanish flu of 1918 has become the common flu of 2020. Okay, We don't have – you can take a shot for it every year and ask anybody that takes the shot if they got the flu that year. It, 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 it's not a definitive scenario. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying a lot of people don't take it. They'd rather get the flu and go forward with it. This is going to be the same situation. There's far too many variables, and I think, in my opinion, it's going to play out the exact same way. I think it's something that we're going to deal with until it, we deal with it. And I think if you go back and look at the history of that and see how that kept reappearing, meaning the Spanish flu, the CDC has If you go on the CDC website, they have a whole breakdown of the timeline on the, on the um, Spanish flu. Because of the similarities, they're so profound in how it came onto society, on how it affected society, on how it kept sprouting back up, and there were second and third waves of it that kept sprouting back up. Because if you don't ever effectively abolish it, it's going to keep coming back, right? Yes. I mean, it, it's an active, it's an active element, so it, it's it's not going to go away. So I just think that the more people can prepare. Um, I think, you know, I said back in then, and I'm saying it again, there's just, there's just a, going to be a, a, a f eventually when the free market can be free again. And unfortunately, um, we've been dealing in a manufactured environment for the last three or four months that's pumped people full of a lot of misconception, unfortunately. A lot of that can drive through their own means, though, because you don't hear the Fed, the Fed chairman coming on saying, listen, go buy houses and go play. You know what I mean? Like, this is stuff that people are doing amongst themselves on Facebook and social media. And it's just making the situation worse that, 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 you know, when you have a vehicle like that to help perpetuate bad information, then people think if they read it somewhere and it sounds somewhat logical, even though it really isn't, um, that it's gotta be true. So they just follow the, the, the rest of the herd. And unfortunately it becomes significantly problematic and, 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 and it leaves people in uncomfortable positions. We've talked repeatedly about how important it is, to, especially when you're going FHA, one of those low down payment programs, how important it is to buy the house at the right number, you know? And um, we are telling people, wait another year to a year and a half because that's when prices are going to eventually... Uh... I, I, but I, 
it's inevitable, right? If you believe, like, like I always say the same thing, because there's so many people that are just that, that are just blind to it. And I and listen, you, you you guys, every per single person is welcome to to make whatever decision that they want. You could take what I think with a grain of salt. You could you could completely embrace it. Anybody that follows this regularly knows that most of the stuff, if not all of it, that I talk about. I'm right on. I'm not. I'm not shooting from the hip here. I've been in business for a long time. I've experienced the fallout in 08. This is the second one that's gone on. I've seen ebbs and flows in every single market you can imagine: the real estate, the stock market, the bond market, etc. And I've experienced it, meaning I'm part of that market, right? So I'm not speaking from somebody that's uneducated. I'm speaking from a position of experience. And I think when when you see situations where unemployment is going up like this, um, and we get back to you know, a a stable market, right? Meaning where it's not being manufactured, it's a true free market where free market energies are actually flowing again, which unfortunately is what's happening right now for Main Street, right? They're not getting the money coming in. So they're they're stuck flat-footed because it was advertised for a while there was going to be another stimulus package. As a result, what do you think those people are going to do though if they know that they're not getting that extra 600 a pay period? They're going to stop spending, right? Yeah. Because that wealth's been cut off. Well, where do you think that money was going? That money was going to retail sales. Remember that great number that came out on retail sales back in June that everybody decided to go out and buy houses because they said that the economy's recovered? Uh, they that were, they were $70,000 over asking price, Jay. This is what I'm saying. But this is it all goes hand in hand, right? When somebody who doesn't follow the economy pulls up Facebook or pulls up this and says, retail sales up 19% uh, month over month well first of all the last month was at like zero percent so you could be misled by it right but the fact of the matter is that 20 percent was all correlated to that yeah who who who's going out and buying clothes in a pandemic right who's going who's going out and buying you know what i mean like it's it's, it's that that's that's that 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 is a that is a impulse buy because somebody has more liquidity than they had before right yes so then when people see the retail sales go up it's like, oh man, things must be improving. They see that headline, right? On yep. Apple. Retail sales up nineteen percent month over month. Then what? Guess what? The following month, real estate sales up four percent. Because it becomes is it most people get their education on things through headlines, especially economically. They don't try to make sense out of it. Cool. So when you extract that liquidity, when you extract liquidity from any situation, right? Whether it be look back in 08. Anybody that understands what happened in 08, and I'm not saying this is similar. This is different in some way. It's not. It's unique, but it, it's an example for, as far as the liquidity is concerned. If you go back to, if you go back to 08, the reason why immediately that you saw the real estate prices drop significantly further than they were already is because immediately they cut back the liquidity on housing. The minute that the, that things started falling apart with the banks, they cut back. Literally, lending was frozen. Right. I mean, you had to, they went from overnight, they went from like a, a, a 620 FHA to it was like 68. And this was, this, there was no liquidity to buy. So they, the banks weren't originating because the, their investors didn't want to buy. So what did you see as a result of that? You take that liquidity away and houses plunged even further. And they kept plunging. They plunged for two or three years. Oof. Yes. They, 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 they didn't bottom, legitimately bottom and find rally until 2012 after it started in 08. And that was as liquidity slowly started to come back into the system. So the point I'm trying to make is that liquidity that was coming in the form of extra unemployment, that liquidity that was coming in the form of these EIDLs and SBAs for people with 575 credit, that liquidity is no longer. Oof. So then what happens to that individual's ability to, to buy, to purchase? Sure, they're protected. They're not going to go – they're not going to have to get to go to court. They're not going to have to get evicted. They're protected in that capacity, Correct. right? Which is great. I think that's good. I think that's necessary. But I'm talking about everything else, right? But you got to upkeep too, Jay. You got to do. You got to deal with the upkeep. You know what I'm saying? Like of the house. Of the house, yeah. But you're talking about owners of the house. Owners so yeah, of the house. Landlords, the eviction. But you're right. There is foreclosure. There is foreclosure. You know forbearances too so it goes hand in hand but there is going to come a time there is going to come a time when even that stops yeah right and you're talking about somebody that hasn't paid rent in eight nine months right a year whenever that comes but that's even another huge domino this there's is, so uh, many dominoes this is... there's so many bullets in the chamber right now that haven't even been triggered yet 
right? That haven't even been like the, the commercial mortgages, the residential mortgages. The, I mean, it's, it's just a lot. There's still a lot that needs to play out, which is why I said once you can start getting some real economic numbers based upon extracting that liquidity out of the system, meaning the consumer liquidity, the unemployment liquidity, the EIDL liquidity, and all this money that 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 was pumped into. I'll tell you, I have I had clients who listen. I, I always try to stress, and people get annoyed by this, but I, I I don't really care. I always try and stress as much fiscal responsibility as you can, right? Like, yes. I mean, I think I think that's our job. I don't think the people have to listen. They can do whatever they want. We can't force them to do it. But if they do listen, we'll put them in a good position, right? So I have I had a client in Florida in in Port St. Lucie who. He got 150000 the SBA for his business, right, which is great. As, you know, it, it carried him over. He, they do, like, co uh, they do like coax cable. They get subbed out from Comcast and stuff. Yes. A month later, he's like, listen, man, I need you to – I need – and I'm not judging anybody. Again, I'm just giving an example. He's like, I, I, need, uh, I need you to help me out with some investments. I got, you know, business is completely dried up. It doesn't look like it's coming in. And I'm like, all right, so you should still have what? You, what do you got, a couple hundred left? Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm like, well, what about the SBA money and all the other money? He's like, no, 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 that, we, we, we've used that. And I didn't even want to, because I didn't want to feel like I'm judging, but I'm thinking in a month, you spent a couple hundred thousand dollars, and he didn't have anything that he told me purchased with it. You understand what I mean? So it's like, because you had the liquidity, you had to spend the liquidity. And now it puts, and this, and I'm using this as a, as a micro example to a much broader picture that I'm trying to describe. You understand what I mean? He's one example of one person that did it. I guarantee you they're everywhere. Right. And it's a situation yeah. that this is what's going to happen. And then people are going to be like, I'm not I'm not buying retail. Right. I'm not buying. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm going to save as much money as I can because because it's not coming in. That's the natural flow. Right. You do the you do the opposite. So I, I, I just think that for people to think I, I love the ones that are like hey, real estate prices are raging. I'm just going to buy, man. First of all, who the fuck buys at the top? Right, like, why the fuck would you pay seventy? Uh, is that life? they see everybody else buying, Jay? It's like buying know, a used car. The, again, I'm not trying to judge, but I'm just saying, just even if, look, even if, even if you're a child in the lunchroom, right, and you're in, and you're in line, and they're selling cookies, and those yeah. cookies are sixty five cents, and there's one left, and people are paying, everybody's jumping over each other to pay six dollars for it. I feel like even then, somebody would know that's not the right thing to be doing, right? Because yes. it's the next day, there'll be a sixty-five cent cookie waiting for you, right? They just ran out that day, and the same analogy applies with houses. They're not going anywhere. We're not running out of them. Very There's good a analogy. Flow of them. You understand what I mean? Yes. And and the fact of the matter is that I don't know what the rush is. The Fed chief has said he's not raising rates for more than likely probably five years. Oof. Okay. That means that the, the, we're going to have downward pressure on interest rates for five years, which means. At the very least, your borrowing cost is going to be nominal. What is the problem with waiting? Oof. Like, why? Why? Because of the jerk off that lives next door to you, because he had to run out and buy a house in the suburbs. You got to go run out and buy the house next door to him. You know what I mean? Like, what is it about us as human beings that wires somebody to think that you got to chase the guy next door to you that can't even tie his fucking shoes in the morning? You know what I mean? Like, it's it doesn't. I it it, it drives me crazy because it makes no sense. Correct. Right. It makes absolutely no sense when you see stuff like that, because the reality is the guy next door, you probably knows less than you do. Hmm. Right. He'll tell you he knows more, but he probably knows less. Correct. And the reality is you're probably in a better financial position than the guy next door that you're following. He's just trying to give you the perception that he's smarter than you, that he's better off than you, that he and he does it on Facebook by sitting in in, in private jets and leaning on a Rolls Royce. Right. Letting everybody think they're his. It drives me nuts, man. It's all the same circular ridiculousness. And and the reason why I get so passionate about this is because, like, you don't want to see somebody set themselves up for failure, right? And the, the unfortunate reality of the situation is that <clears throat> doing things like this, effectively, you're setting yourself up to put yourself in a really difficult situation. When you're bidding 10% over asking price on a property, I don't care what market you're or in. Or taking out a Think- stupid loan, right, Jay? Like the Omar character. Remember that? Omar. Omar character. Um, oh, um, well, yeah, exactly. But he, listen, he fits every, <laughs> he checks every, he checks every box there is, right? He was, <laughs> he was in, he checked every box possible. He was in the top one per, bottom 1% of clients 
ever in history. So, I mean, it, that is not surprising. I don't think he represents the broader mentality, but I think in situations, you're right, yes, where you, you know, but sometimes taking out a loan out of, like a personal loan or business loan out of necessity, I, I don't judge people for that because they're doing it to, to, for their livelihood, right? When people are going out and chasing their neighbor to go out and buy a house and overpay for that house just like the neighbor did so you can say you spent more than it's worth because you think that makes you sound smart, it's moronic, right? It's moronic. Just mm-hmm. you can put it – the only ones that are winning are the agents that are putting it up on their sites, right? 20% over us, 50 grand over us. I mean they, 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 it's crazy because the person that they sold the house to in six months or eight months or a year when the house is upside down is going to be – it's going to want to strangle them. Like, yeah, why did you show me the house? Because nobody takes accountability, right? No. So they'll, they'll, they'll say that the agent's the one that you know coaxed them into doing it because they had a picture on Facebook that made it look like a new house is a great investment, right? It was. So it'll, it'll, be some, it'll be some kind of ridiculous excuse to lack accountability and, and just not want to take the, the reality of it, which is that maybe it just wasn't smart well, to overbid we, on anything. We're going to get back into this when we get to the comments. A lot of people are commenting. Um, but you know, you are, you are, uh, you know, a lot of people saying preach, preach, preach. <laughs> uh, we got to get into the, uh, the topic, Jay. So we're already an hour, five minutes. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. I, I digress. I, I digress too much. <laughs> no, but it's it, honestly, man, I, I, listen, I, 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 I'm on the phone all day long with clients and I talk about this stuff and then I got to ones that want to start that I talk to and, and, and the perspective is just so heavily molded by the wrong influences, you know, they're influences that, that, that have angles as, a, as, a, as opposed to sincerity. You know what I mean? Like an agent, I, how, how does anybody ever take a real estate agent's advice? I know there's really good ones. And I, in my experience, there's probably about 5% of them that are very good at what they do, right? Exceptional. Right. They understand values. They understand this and that. And they don't need to push you into a certain purchase because they're not chasing commissions. Commissions come to them, right? But then the other 85, 90, 95 percent of them are constantly pushing you into situations that that, that that are in their best interest, as opposed to the individuals. I've seen, I've gotten into screaming matches with agents who get heavy with clients. Yeah, you know, tr- trying to corner them into purchasing and, and doing things that they're not necessarily comfortable with, but help to keep the deal going so that the deal gets closed. And I just think that that's, you know, I think with the proper advice, which is why we try and do this, minus my rants. I think people can get a better understanding. Like we always say at the end of the year, if we help one person, that's one person helped, right? right. That could be the difference between somebody, you know, losing a significant amount of money versus gaining a significant amount of money. So with that being said, yeah, why don't we walk into the topic now that I've burned an hour on this? (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, people say that you're really smart. And I do want to say that, yeah, John of... John will fight you on the phone. <laughs> uh, my wife. No, but just understand. Wife... <laughs> but just understand. It's because of the fact that that anybody that's a client of ours that that has been on the phone when I've been talking on their behalf knows that I I I'm very serious about making sure that people don't get taken advantage of. Right. I, I right. really really bothers me when you have people like car dealership <laughs> situations where it happens or people with motives that they're trying to play on the naivety or the or perceived stupidity of a, a consumer because they believe that the person across them is smarter. It drives me nuts. So I try to level the playing field. And in doing so, I think that it leaves people, allows them to understand what's right, wrong, or different, but it also puts them in a position where they realize that the person that they're talking to at the dealership or at the, this place or that place isn't always right, and they may have an ulterior motive, right? And that ulterior motive may not always be in the best interest of the client. And I think, you know, if there are clients, you got to try and serve them the best way you can. If that makes sure, you know, if that means you got to dig them out of a bad situation, like happens sometimes, then that's what we got to do. So, yeah, I do get, I mean, look, you can probably feel it coming to the phone. But when I talk about this stuff, it drives me nuts. Um, Because I just think that I think, uh, I think, I I, I don't, I, I don't know. I just, I just think that. Right now, people are getting all their information from Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, you want to talk about a credit board on steroids. It's exactly what it is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a credit board on steroids. So you have... And you have prominent people who are like, they have other credit repair businesses and they're like, they push that stuff, you know? Um, 
you yeah, know, yeah, the, I was I, I was I, laughing I, about about the guy, uh, the credit repair guy that I saw on Instagram. There's eight credit bureaus, Jay. You know that, right? Yeah, no, I know. I saw it. you sent it to me. There's and, and, eight, and, and, eight, and, and, eight credit it, bureaus. It, but, but listen, it, go ahead. Finish what you're saying. I'm sorry. And, and they lock. And they lock all eight. <laughs> they lock all eight. <laughs> They disappear in society. I mean, I don't even under it's it's. Uh, but this, I, I could go on for this forever, and I don't want to rip anybody apart, right? I, I mean, if that's how somebody makes their their living and does it, maybe they don't know better. I don't know, right? Maybe they don't really know the answer, and their answer is the wrong answer, and they feel like they're giving the right answer. I don't know. I don't want to villainize everybody. That is um, true. But, that is true. But but I but I think <laughs> there is a very legitimate faction of people that do business that know they're taking advantage of people, and they do. And they're the ones that I feel like I, I lose my shit with the worst because I just, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, like you don't, you don't, it just doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't, you know, when you're at a car dealership, I know I talk about this all the time, but I've gotten more screaming matches with those people than, than, than I can even describe because it's like, you know, you're, you're taking, you, you, you eye up this, you know, 60 year old woman that's by herself, not with her husband. And you look at her like, like, like prey, right? You come up, you see what she understands, you realize she doesn't necessarily understand things, yeah. you pull her credit, she might have one imperfection, when in reality, she's probably like a 4.5% risk, right? She might have a 720, but like, let's just say she had one small medical collection for 100 bucks, right? Still a 720. That guy's going to come back and be like, well, ma'am, you know what? You got this collection, and it is destroying your credit. So your, your interest rate's going to be 8.5%, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? When <laughs> in reality probably four right so now this woman who doesn't know any better and thinks the guy's doing her a favor across from him because because he just brings up about a collection that she knew that she didn't pay oh. but thought it was the only one and didn't yes. think it would impact her that much because she doesn't understand credit has now just realized she's like oh man at least i can get it at eight percent you know yes great i got the loan awesome not realizing that that additional four percent is costing her probably on a thirty thousand dollar loan over five years, probably fourteen, fifteen grand. Yes. And they're getting paid on that same three thirty thousand dollar car. That four percent yield spread's giving them twelve hundred dollars. Twelve hundred dollars for that fifty, sixty year old woman to pay fourteen extra thousand. Yeah. So it's like you know, I mean, when you when you start looking at it from that perspective, you know, it. Those arguments are worthy of those arguments, right? Because that twelve hundred dollars, which is probably getting split five ways in that dealership, pales in comparison to the fourteen that she's going to have to pay back, right? Additionally, right. than what she was probably rated at, which is why, to this day, I don't think. I mean, Cedric was. I don't know why he didn't bring it up to us after or before he went. But ninety-five percent of our clients, we line up with financing before they go to the auto dealer, and I'm giving. Oh, I gave percent. examples. Uh, what was it? Um, uh the thumbnail for um no not that one uh no, no, no but but it's it's it's, it's all it's yeah. it's it's all of because there's a five percent deviation that i'm providing because of the fact that there's some people that just do it without even thinking to reach out to us it's an impulse scenario and they Correct. some people are just impulsive and they go and do it and then after the fact they're like shit what did i do why did i do that blah 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 and then we got to reverse engineer and fix it but most of the people we've programmed to this point to to, 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 to reach out to us, we get them approved, we get them the right rate so that they're not overpaying what they should be, and then they, they get into a sustainable situation which they can maintain as opposed to driving off the lot. And we made a podcast about that too. But okay, let's. I, I don't, again, I'm going, I'm going in, uh, in, in, um, I do want to at least for five minutes talk about what the topic of the podcast is. So if anybody, no, 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 people are there. loving, people are loving the, um, you know. Check out this uh, video, my people, about how to refinance your car loan the best way. Uh, hint, fix your credit. Uh, we go into two scenarios into how we helped out a customer last year, which John told me he he got more than whatever I said. I said he refinanced uh, two vehicles, but then he ended up getting another vehicle. Yeah. And then the last customer, uh, which was like last month, um, he uh, he was able to refinance to a better rate. But just understand, understand, most of the clients aren't refinancing the cars. What they Correct. ultimately do is just get a new car at a low interest rate, and they'll either trade the car in or they'll roll the negative equity into the new loan at a lower interest rate, which allows them to pay a get a new car, which is more in line with the credit. But B and C allows them to pay back any negative equity 
that they roll into the loan quicker because the interest rate's like two, three, four percent, right? It's effectively free money. So even though they front load loans, all loans, uh, school loans, um, personal loans, auto loans, mortgages, all the the, the interest is front loaded by the banks, right? So yep. on the back end, if you have no interest or your interest cost is very low, a, a large majority of your payment, in the, even on the front end of the loan, is going to go towards principal, which allows you to pay back that negative equity and pay the principal down quickly, right? So you see that balance go down much quicker. And again, is in a much more sustainable situation as far as, um, you know, the person being able to maintain it, right? I All mean, right. it's just how it is. Okay, mi gente. Check this out. A lot of you come to us and you're looking to boost your credit ASAP. We recommend adding trade lines once all the negative accounts are removed from your credit file. And also, um, by the way, this topic will be at a one hour, 15 minutes uh, into the podcast. So um, once every negative item is removed, when you add your authorized user or you go to a catalog type of um, pay you know, every primary trade line that you pay month to month, uh, we say we say people, you know, you could boost your credit scores. But there is also um, boost, um, Experian Credit Boost. <clears throat> and some people always ask if it works, if it doesn't. Right now, John's going to tell you the truth about it. Uh, so, John, does Experian Credit Boost really work? Right. So, I'm glad we kind of prefaced everything we did leading up to this because it okay. built some skepticism into the conversation. So at least it allows to carry through. So obviously Experian came out, it was a year ago with the boost option, right? And let's just take the boost option. Everybody adds it and, 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 and thinks that somehow they're like self-lending accounts. People do that too. And then they realize after the fact, they don't really do anything. But if you look at um, just Experian boost at its core, the idea behind Experian boost is that you give them your own personal, bills, whether it's your cell phone bill, your utility bill, your rent, your whatever bills that they're willing to accept, which is most of the time, most utilities and other types of, I think you can even add insurance in there if you want, um, they'll add and then they'll effectively report. So it adds additional accounts to your file. And then lo and behold, poof, your score goes up on Experian.com, 12 points, right? 10 yes. points when you add it. Just <clears throat> add it just randomly, right? It just happens to be 10, 12 points when you add that. It's, it's funny how it works out exactly like that each time. But, 12 points um, all the time? I, it's not, I, I mean, it, it ends up being like the exact same amount, right? But, mm. but here's the kicker, though. You, number one, um, when it comes to adding those particular accounts, those accounts hold very little water in the in the in the case of like how the components of the report and how the allocations of scoring are allocated within the context of the report. So your active scoring components are your unsecured credit ratio. That swings meaning your total credit card limits against the balances. That swings your scores all over the place as that usage goes up and goes down, et cetera, right? Yes. The other things <clears throat> are maintained, so they get built in immediately. You get a little bit of an adjustment and then that is maintained, right? So when you get a mortgage or an auto loan, you'll immediately see your score drop after you make a couple payments, it'll revert back up. You get a couple points additionally and then that'll just be built in, it'll be kicked in. So when you're adding these accounts, it's the equivalent of adding like a secured card. You get nothing for it, right? Not only that, it's just like adding an account. So it really doesn't do a whole lot for you, but here's what it does that doesn't help. It now effectively sets you up. So whereas AT&T didn't have any reporting for you on a monthly basis, your utility companies didn't have any reporting for you on a monthly basis, your insurance company didn't have reporting for you on a monthly basis, all these different creditors now have you in a headlock because mm. you've now added it to the credit report. And the reality is Experian gets money from them signing up with that service to add them. So Experian is getting money from you on the monitoring side. Experience getting money from that creditor now because now they're in the system and it's a monthly fee that they're getting from the creditor. So in essence, the purpose of it was for them to generate revenue. Well done. Good job. Awesome advertising Whoa. and marketing angle, right? But the reality is now what the consumers don't realize is that now they're screwed because some people don't pay their utility bills on time. Oh, I spoke to a girl. Before. I spoke to um someone to the yesterday that we're fixing their credit and then we had to stop a uh, North Carolina uh, girl. And she's no Illinois girl, uh, and she's trying to uh, get an apartment now. And guess why he she she well her credit scores are not there yet because she only we were only into two disputes. Um, but she says she has two utility bills 
that she didn't pay that's reporting negative on her credit report. Yeah, so normally that only reports when it goes to collection. Correct. Which is typically three or four months down the line, right? Yes. Now, if you're just a couple days late, you're held to the same regard. Most people weren't treating their utility bills like that. Most people knew that if they paid their cell phone bill a couple days late, they just had to catch up and it didn't affect yes, their credit. Yes. Now they're exposing themselves to that. Right. So now those and now they're making it worse because in a lot of cases, these were bills that most people weren't paying exactly on time mm. because they knew it didn't impact their credit. So let's 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 go back for a second. Experian does this incredible marketing campaign to make it seem like Experian Boost is this great thing where you add all these new accounts. Right. And these are accounts that aren't reporting and everything is great. It's going to raise your score. But here's what really happens. Experian gets all this new money. From all these new creditors, it could be every utility company in the United States. They get to sign all of them up, and they charge a monthly fee to them. AT and T, Comcast, your cable bill, so on and so forth. The cable companies and the utility bills love it because now you're bound by this, right? Correct. So they love it because before you'd be like, man, f them. I'll pay them on the fortieth day, and I get it on the thirtieth day. Yep. Now you got to pay them on the thirtieth day, right? Yes. Or sooner because they're going to screw your credit up, and you signed up for that. Mm. Because you got bamboozled by the Experian commercial. And in reality, if you took that same report with that Comcast bill on it, and you went and had a hard pull done, your score is going to deviate one iota. It's going to be the same score. But John, because those, um, those accounts mean nothing because there's no history built into them. And every time you go to Comcast, let's say you rent from a place for 12 months, and you <clears> do it again, and do it again. There's no history built into them. So they don't give you anything, and even the history element of the credit report is a small denominator compared to some of the larger ones, right? And you really have to run those out for a long period of time to really see the significance of that. So this is just another example of the consumer getting bamboozled by some very good marketing, right? But John, John, John Zena is on the commercial. It has to be good if John he, Zena is on the commercial. He probably doesn't even know what he's marketing. <laughs> The fact, of the, the fact of the matter, though, is that it's not the, – the people are signing up for this thinking it's going to help them. It's not going to help. It's going to put you in a worse situation. And let me just take it one step further. You adding on there your cable bill for 150 bucks a month, right? And you adding on there your gas bill for $250 a month. And yeah. you adding on there your insurance bill for $180 a month. That now gets calculated in your debt-to-income ratio because it's on your credit report. Oh, that also gets calculated into your your DTI. For I mean, purchasing you're, you're... a house. So if you add another three hundred, because normally they use a blanket number. That's where fifty five percent debt to income comes from. It comes from the idea that forty five percent goes towards taxes, insurance, gas, groceries, etc. But they use all the bills in the credit report. So now, if your monthly bill on your cable is two hundred dollars, two hundred dollars represents a three percent interest. That's uh, what is that? Eighty thousand dollars in buying power you just lost by adding one account that got you no score, right? Got you absolutely no score increase. In reality, on Experian.com, you got a you know ten point score increase. Yeah. But in reality, when you go to a real lender, right, that's using a true FICO A formula, you're not going to see that score jump. But you taxed yourself. Oof. Right. So when you add two or three or four of them, you're like, yeah, man, let me just let me just go all in, which people do, right? They go balls in. So why not add them all? So, right? John, you got three accounts, let's say, right? Insurance, cell phone, and what else? Cable, Utility. Comcast. Comcast. <clears throat> Comcast. That's like pff, 170. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you take the, you take the, you take your cell phone bill for 200. I mean, let's say it's 150, right? Correct. Let's say your cable is 170. Let's just say your insurance, your, your car insurance is another 150. That's 400 and almost $500. $500 represents about $165,000 in buying power. You just wiped out. That's like having a car loan on your credit report. It's, it's that that, that having, doesn't stop. It's, it's equivalent to having about a $30,000 $30, car loan. And you did it because you thought it helped your score. But that doesn't because stop, John. At least with a car. Experian marketing made you believe that it's going to add 15 points to your credit report. Crazy, right? It's crazy. If you really peel the layers away, and this is what I was talking about earlier, that's why I said it was a good segue. I think I you sent know, you a you... picture of someone that does credit repair from Facebook and said something about Experian something, and that it says new FICO, this is the FICO formula, get at me, or something like that. 
And I'm like, why, why would they say that? What do you mean? I don't understand what you mean. No, they they were praising the new FICO for Experian formula or whatever. Well, I'm not speaking about any particular formula. I'm speaking about the platform itself, which is Experian.com selling this. No, no, that's what I mean from Experian. The, 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 the boosting. Well, they, they, who knows what people talk Listen, half the shit that comes out is nonsense. Another third of it is ridiculous, and there's a very small percentage of it which is which makes sense, and you can tie back to reality. And, 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 and but you Jay, see how I take these topics and I walk it back, right? So I take it from from A and I walk it all the way to Z. So anybody with an understanding of this stuff can understand it when I explain it, right? And you don't need to be, have an MBA from Harvard to be able to understand a lot of these economic things when they're explained the way I do. You try anybody that's that's listening to this or that decides to listen to this. Anybody that you deal with in any walk of finance should be able to do that in anything you get yourselves involved in. They should be able to walk you back in explaining a topic to you. If they can't, they're talking shit. Correct. Right? They should be able to walk it back to the origination of the thought to be able to explain to you why they're telling you that. If they can't explain that to you to where you understand it, it's because they don't fucking know it. So right? Jay, could it be that, yes, you're trying to buy a house, right? And you add these two things, three things onto your credit report, let's say they're 300 bucks. Yeah, yeah, it's not a good look. For what would they do this for? Just for, uh, you know, to make them feel good? John Cena told him. John I, Cena know, told I know, I know. I know, it's more of uh, like if they're at 770 and they want a 780 to, what do you call it when you when you uh, when you want to vanity, show off the vanity play? But it, it's vanity, vanity play. But 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 it, that's not that's not what's happening. See, that's the problem. The guy at seven seventy isn't doing it. You're feeding on the guy at five sixty. The guy that, that that really needs the right advice and is getting the bad advice. Well, right? Jay, look, manipulated. we have a lot of people and a lot of you listen to our our, our channel and our videos. And a lot of you sometimes, you know, you come to us and you say, listen, I don't know how to go about doing such and such thing. And we educate you. An example of that is we have Anibal Colon, who is on the on the chat right now speaking to, you know, like Carissa, um, the first generation project. Um, and Anibal is a perfect example. You know, he schedules calls. He, we educate him, and we had a a long thirty minute conversation. You may say, John. Yeah, I think it was like that. But I mean, he he listen. He he uh, he, has, he has questions. He wants to learn. He wants to understand. He wants to make sense out of it. Some people's brains are drawn to that, right? Correct. They want to be able to understand what they're getting themselves into. I I commend that. And I did the other day. But I think in general, though, I think whether – look, there's a lot of people that listen to these that don't even start with us, right? Yeah, and, and I think that's great. I want people to learn the right way. The point I'm trying to make is if you're not going to start with us and you want to make sure – maybe find somebody cheaper that or that you're more in line with psychologically, then ask them to walk back whatever questions you have. They should be able to explain to you. If you ask the plumber how he plumbed that, you know, that faucet, he'd be able to show you. And by the end of it, you may not be able to do it, but you'll understand it, right? Yeah. You shouldn't be walking in. You shouldn't be promising. If somebody says, to you, yeah, I'll get it done in two weeks, ask them how the fuck they're doing that. Because that's nonsense. Yeah. Right? If somebody's telling you that they're cleaning credit in two weeks consistently, nonstop, and it's just like clockwork, tell them to explain to you how they do that. Yep. Because they, 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 there's no way they're going to be able to explain that to you. There's absolutely nobody that can tell you with 100% surety that they're getting every file done in two weeks. But we hear that sometimes. Correct. Right? So I, I'm just saying, I think it's always good for people. You know, you should be able to properly communicate your trade or whatever it is that you're doing to people so that the client does understand. Now, granted, in our particular line of work, it's a situation where, you know, we're explaining a lot of different facets of finance. But I think it's good for the people that want to learn because they walk away with it with an education and an understanding that's a hands on education. In my opinion, I think that goes better than than reading it. That's how I feel. I feel like, you know, you know, uh, Doing it and learning why you're, you know, learning why you're running, I feel like is a more profound, longer lasting, deeper understanding than if you read it in a book. That's just me personally, right? And I think that, that I, I witness it with clients over the last decade that we've had that, that, that really dig in and they ultimately end up learning even when they're not trying to. And by the end of it and when they start running their own stuff after we're done and we get them positioned. You know, you see the stuff that they've learned and, 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 it, and it's, it's a beautiful thing when it plays out that way. Check this out, Jay. So you telling me 
when a vehicle is on your credit report and let's say it's 30,000 the minimum, the payment on that is 500 that could take a uh, take away from your buying power to get a mortgage right but on that vehicle there's a time stamp on that vehicle just like there's going to be a time stamp of when you're going to stop paying your student loan or when you're going to stop paying your car but when it comes to this experience credibles is there a a uh, what you call it? A timestamp? No, it's, it's not a timestamp. You, you the, the, the way they're measuring it is based off the balance. There's no timestamp. It's, it's the balance, right? So you have a balance. They're using that balance to back in from, and it's an open positive account, right? So when you go for a mortgage, when you and, and you owe you owe the gas company a couple hundred bucks, like we said, and it's a month revolving. If it's a revolving account, which effectively it is, when you have when you have a, a you know a, these these this Comcast Comcast and the insurance company, you know, all of them, they're extending credit to you. Yes. So whether or not you realize it or not, you're getting credit. You're not paying in advance for the gas that comes to your house. You're paying after the fact. Yes. So you're getting a revolving account with them. So when they report it, it reports it revolving. And if it's that amount, that's what they're going to use to back it in from. That's just the fact of the matter. And when it comes to an auto loan, if you pay $560 a month and there's a balance left on that, they're not going to, they're going to say, okay, there's a balance. And yes, your payment is 560. So for the foreseeable future, that's the amount you're paying. It's going to count against your debt to income. Mm. So it doesn't go about how long it's going to take for you to pay that. It goes. They don't, there's not a formula that factors into the, to the length of the, that actual loan. It's factored in that moment. So when you apply for that mortgage, it goes into that 55%. All the debts on your credit report are getting backed out when the credit cards, the minimum payment on the credit cards, right? It, that's what's, because that's the monthly payment that's due when you have a, when you have a, uh, you know, like I said, a Comcast bill, it's 250 bucks. That's what's going to work against it. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, people just don't, people just do things blindly. They, they don't back into the fight. You have to take it second, third, fourth step until you realize that they got hoodwinked. Oof. Right? Because in reality, the only one that wins, the only one that really loses for the record in those Experian Boost situations is the consumer. Because and when they, they stop, and when they stop it, Jay, their credit score is gonna go back down to what it was. Yeah, but only only on Experian.com, on Experian, not reality. Correct. It's a it's a it's a mirage. It's not reality, man. These platforms are platforms. Yeah. Right. That's all. They're just platforms. Credit Karma is a platform. Equifax.com is a platform. Experian.com is a platform. Granted, yeah. Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, they're owned by the same place, right? But TransUnion.com uses a Vantage score. No, no walk of popular credit uses Vantage scoring. So people go in there and they think that that's their score with TransUnion, like the Bureau. No, no. It's a totally different formula. Yes. You go to Equifax.com, they use a Beacon formula. Nobody uses Beacon anymore. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm being serious. So that's why that score will deviate greatly. It's why it's always over conservative. Experian typically uses FICO 8, but as you can see, they can get funny with the formulas. Mm. So they can play it to their to their end if they need to. The thing, I, the point I'm trying to impress upon is the fact that they sign up to get kicked. You know, people that sign up for this sign up to get kicked in the ass, right? Yeah. Because the reality is, you're signing up to not to now have three or two or whatever you had creditors on there that didn't have a, you in a headlock before. You had flexibility to pay them as long as you paid it before it was turned off. It didn't bother you anymore, right? But the fact of the matter is now, now you're on 30-day terms with them, tight 30-day terms. And now you've just added pressure to a situation where maybe you didn't need pressure because you thought you could get 10 points on your credit report because you were misled to think it was going to – they don't really tell you in the marketing how much it's going to jump, right? They just tell you it's going to jump. Yes. Right? But the reality is if you go for a hard pull, you're not going to see that anyway. So it's irrelevant strictly for that platform. So the marketing is primo, right? Primo marketing. Right, but at the end of the day, and the kicker is that it counts against you in your debt to income ratio when you go to buy a house. So it can significantly, depending on how many you've added, it can significantly impact if you're unaware when you go to apply. And your, your mortgage guy may not even be able to communicate this right properly to you because not everybody understands it. Not everybody understands everything they're doing. It's just the reality, of, you know, the, the line of work. You could have a mortgage guy that's great, you could have one that's terrible. But the fact of the matter is, they may not even properly communicate to you where they could be like, "Listen, guy, you got to close this." these three self-reported accounts and then that'll free us up with a hundred grand of buying power. Right. There you they go. may just be like, all right, you're only approval for 90 grand. So, you know, you that's do the it. best you can do. And the consumers on the other end, like, damn, I got a seven eighty, and I make this and I only approve for 90 grand <laughs> <laughs> and they can't make sense out of it. Right. But that's right. why though. it's why I'm, t I mean, that's not the only reason why, but I'm just saying that that would be a real example I just described. So, 
I just think that, you know, it's, it, it's something that people should be aware of. I think that a lot of times there's a lot of misleading information around these platforms. Credit Karma, we did one of these already. We did a podcast on what's the right one to use, so on and so forth, which yes. is the best one that we think and whatever the case may be. But I'm just saying that people need to understand there's a difference between the true bureau scores. All these different scores are formula based, right? Uh, they, they all could, there's so many different scoring formulas. There's some that are used more commonly than others, right? Correct. Vantage doesn't get scoring, doesn't get utilized by anybody. There's no walk of credit that uses a Vantage scoring model. Identity IQ uses Vantage scoring. Credit mm-hmm. Karma uses Vantage scoring. TransUnion.com uses Vantage scoring. They don't tell anybody in any disclaimer that that. They don't tell anybody about that. They don't. There's, a, there's no. There's no bio in it that says that. Listen, we use a Vantage scoring model. No walk of credit uses this, but you know this is what we've decided to use because it's owned by the three bureaus and it's our way of, of trying to monetize and hopefully push this into existence and push Fair, Fair Isaac or FICO out of it. They don't see any of that stuff anywhere, Correct. right? They just they, they just let people literally lose their minds watching the stuff on Credit Karma go. What you know, their their usage increased five percent, their score drops a hundred points, right? Correct. And it, you put with Credit Karma, people don't realize when you put accounts into dispute, any accounts into dispute on Credit Karma, it drops the score automatically. Now that's not a real drop. That's not a genuine drop. That's not a drop you see on a hard pool. They do it because that's how their platform reads a, a, a dispute. Yeah, but so it's lose, it's um people lose their minds when they see it. They're like, what happened? Well, John, it's it's happened. your it's your fault. You put things in dispute that you're supposed to put in dispute. But it's but 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 the. <laughs> No, 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 but you know, it's they don't even come at it like that. They come at it like they're losing, they're losing, they're losing their mind because they're like, how did this happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, just go, listen, do me a favor. Go over to, you have an Experian.com account. First and foremost, please stop using Credit Karma. Second, yes. please go over to your Experian.com account and see that there's no score drops. So how could that happen? That one site shows a 65 point drop and the other one doesn't show it. And here's why. And then you explain it. But the fact of the matter is there's no disclaimer anywhere on Credit Karma that says that. Yeah, but there's sometimes no, we have to yell nothing. at people. I mean, you can make you can make you can make an entire website. You could make a an entire television series on all the nuances that exist on Credit Karma. But it's like the most popular credit site there is because it's free. Correct. It's crazy. Correct. It's crazy. So I mean, I, I could talk for a long time about that too. So so the boost. Um, let me see who asked here. Kurt? Uh, no, not Curtis. Fat boy. He asked, uh, "What you guys have?" Uh, you guys may have addressed this, but is it true that Experian Boost raises your score, but it also adds to your DTI? Yeah, that's what we finished ranting on right now, uh, Fat Boy. It, 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 it doesn't raise your score legitimately, though. It raises your score on Experian.com. Correct. Only on Experian.com it raises your credit score. You might see you might see a blurb anywhere else, right? And that could be associated with anything. But on Experian, you'll see it on Experian.com because that's where you have to put it through immediately notified that's where you have to submit it and as a response to the notification when it reflects you're like yay six points yay, but wait 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 jay five points wait 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 hold up jay i got a question right now we just came in because if you have three credit scores um that are gonna be one that's high one that's middle which is your fico and the one that's the the lowest right are you gonna when you get let's say Experian is the one that is uh, your FICO score, which is the middle score of it all? When you go for the mortgage, will they look at just your FICO score and base your DTI and everything based on that? Or how about if it's on Experian that you get the credit boost, but Experian becomes uh, the highest? Experian reports it to all three though. You you submitted through Experian, but it gets it shows on all three. Ask anybody that's utilized it; they reflect it to all three. Okay, but you finished saying that only Experian will give you the boost, but not the no, other. no. You're not, you're confusing what I'm saying. Experian.com gives you the points on their site because they're triggered. I'm not saying you're getting points on a real poll from anyone. Experian.com again is a platform. It's a platform. Correct. Correct. It's all it is. It's a platform that's owned by Experian. It is a platform. That means it is a, it, it, all it is is a housing for whatever it is they're trying to sell. The same with Equifax, same with TransUnion. So you put it through their site. You submit those requests for the boost through their site. And when they report, yeah, I got six points. Yeah, I got five points. And then Equ- Experian notifies the other two bureaus. 
of those accounts. So it shows on all three, but you don't get any score jumps for that. Oof. That's what I'm saying. There's no. It's not a win anywhere. There, if you look at it at, at, at its core, that's it's a kick in the nuts. And when you bend over, it's a it's a kick in the ass. You know, I mean, there's there's nothing to it that helps the consumer. But as far as the debt to income, you're going to see it on all three. It's going to reflect on all three, and it's going to impact you on all three. Boost is a joke. Six to ten points. Curtis Davis. Yeah, it is a joke. It's a joke anyway, and probably most of the people that have used it realize it's a joke. It's just like those self lender accounts. Those self lender accounts are a joke, right? Correct. They're just they're just dressed up secured cards. That's it. That's all they are. So if you didn't want a secure card, why do you want a self lender account? It doesn't make any sense. So I mean, in the because, event, just Jay, just add you know, authorized just users. A that, would... that looks prettier. What's that? In the event that you just want to boost in credit scores, just add an authorized user. Don't even recommend. Well, hey, listen, we, we did a whole podcast on that. How to raise your credit scores quick. Correct. How to, how to do it right. How to do it quick. We go into an entire three hours spiel about that. Correct. If you're not sick of hearing me spiel about things, go watch that. Yeah, that's true. You'll really get sick of hearing me spiel about things. But the, um, the, the, the quickest way to get your scores up quickly and legitimately and, and regardless of the formula is to either pay down your debt, your credit cards, right? right. To get your unsecured credit ratio lower because that is the most active portion of your credit report. Correct. The most active scoring denominator that exists in your credit report. So as your unsecured credit ratios cumulatively go up and down, the scores move with that. Every one of your credit cards reports at a different time each month. Some people get like one inquiry and they're like, oh man, that one inquiry dropped my score eight points. No, it didn't. It just happened to coincide with a statement that just for reported on one of your cards and your usage went up and subsequently the score went down. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and that is if you really want to move your scores and quickly, then you can even learn. We talk about how to time it and things like that in there. And if for some reason you don't have the money to pay down, let's say you're somebody that has a $60,000 in limits and you're like 50 grand. Right, and you can you don't have the ability to come up with forty or fifty grand to get it down to make up those points, and you want to get a couple AUs, um, you can also do that. That'll help feather out because that ratio is the determining factor, and that's effectively what those AUs do. It'll raise right. your limit, right? So in this case, if it was sixty thousand dollars limits, fifty thousand dollars balance, and you went and got two twenty five thousand dollars AUs you're, with no with no balance, you would now have one hundred ten thousand dollars in limits. And your balance would be 50, and you would go from like 90% down to 50%. You're going to move about 30, roughly about 30 points, 25 points per bureau. Correct. And that happens immediately upon reporting. So these are the quickest and easiest and most sustainable ways, and they're not – it doesn't matter the formula. It Correct. doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter the situation. It works like a clock. Correct. So if you need a hard and fast way to do a watch that, we're going to a lot of depth on that, but that's the reason. Correct. Now let's get let's get. Uh, I mean, if you're if we're not done, I mean, we're we're gonna get into some questions. Yeah, I'm done because I gotta get off at eight. So. Oh, you gotta uh, get off at eight. So we only have a couple of minutes, guys. Uh, not a couple of minutes. minutes. We got fifteen minutes. All right. So we started talking about uh, the first gen project. Carissa is on the line saying hello. Stock market. She says something. The stock market is controlled by the one percenters. That's why it's still up. Is there any truth to that? I mean, look, I, I, the stock market, is, it's got its trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars of, of volume on a daily basis. I mean, they, 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 they're, it's invested in mutual funds. I mean, there's so many fund flows that come into that to think that one, I mean, who controls those particular mutual funds and all the hedge funds? Uh, I'm sure the concentration as far as ownership is, is tight, but the reality is that it's not one or two people that's making all these purchases on a daily basis. I mean, you're talking about a significant amount of money. So, no, I mean, that's not realistic but I, I mean I, again I in this particular instance we keep going up because we're being propped up going into a political you know in, into a in, into a, an election and the propping will probably continue at least on this side of things until after the election depending on who wins the election so I mean I wouldn't be surprised if you see it into the I mean we may see some zigs and zags but net net I we're probably going to have some we're probably going to be cruising. I mean, look, a good idea of this is that, you know, the VIX, which is the volatility index on the, in the stock market, it, it basically is a, it's called the fear gauge, and it tells you how many people, it's, it's, it's the ratio of put calls, uh, and, the, and put calls are, call, are options, I'm sorry, uh, put options. It, it puts are basically 
people buying insurance thinking that the stock's going to go down or they're just buying naked puts, which means they think stocks are going to go down. But a lot of times what people do is they'll buy an equity position in the stock and then they'll buy a put to protect the downside in case it reverses well mm-hmm. or in case it goes down while they own it. So they make money both ways and effectively it, it shows up as insurance. But when you see those put volumes spike, you see the VIX, the VIX go up, right? Sure. And the VIX has been going up now for three weeks and the stock market has just been trading higher. The two don't ever go in conjunction. They rarely go in conjunction. Typically speaking, if you've heard me talk about this before, when they do go in conjunction, it normally is a sign that, you know, there's a lot of skepticism. So somebody is under this buying this, right? Because there's a lot of put buying, meaning people are buying protection, meaning people don't believe in the market. And somebody is still pushing it higher. So I'll let your imagination bleed to that. But I mean, I think I think the Fed's got a lot of money set aside to keep this market propped up through the election, and I think it'll probably continue to stay that way. Um, but I don't think I don't I don't I don't think it's just you know I, I don't I, I think there's a lot of the retail element just to finish up this point retail element of, of trading which is like you know non institutional non hedge fund etc it has become a very prevalent part of this market over the last since since. COVID started, you know, mm-hmm. when sport people that used to bet on sports, which is an enormous market and couldn't bet on sports, moved into the stock market. Mm-hmm. People that couldn't be in real estate because there's no, there's nothing to buy right now because values are so high on the investment side. And there's just mm-hmm. a lot of uncertainty in that capacity. A lot of them moved over to keep return on money. So it's got a really large retail element and that retail element doesn't necessarily understand everything. Hence mm-hmm. the example I gave earlier about Tesla, where the stock shot up a thousand points over the course of two weeks which is like an 80% return in two weeks on a, on a, based upon the idea that there was a stock split. Stock split is nothing. It means nothing. It means effectively nothing. It, it just means that they're taking the stock price and they're splitting it by, if it's a 5-1 stock split, it's trading at 2,500, they're going to, the stock price is going to get changed to $500. You own still own the same amount. You're going to get a couple more shares, but the value of your, of your, the stock that you own is the same. They're just gifting you more shares because the shares are getting diluted or, are getting diluted, right? Yes. So you're getting more shares, but it, it's not doing anything for the value of your shares. It's still the same. You still, if you if you went up a thousand dollars, you're still up a thousand dollars after the split. So there should have been no reason to increase it. When you see stuff like that, that's 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 not common, right? That's normally indicative of misunderstanding on how the stuff works, and subsequently it means that maybe not the smartest money is helping to push it up, right? Maybe it's people that may not totally understand what that stuff means, and you see it pushing and moving markets around. So. I do think that the, the, the one percent owns a lot of stocks. I, I don't know if the daily zigs and zags is, and I don't know what, you know. I I, I, I just think it's spread out a lot wider than that, though. Okay, all right. So we have Leo Rodriguez who uh, sent us five dollars for some coffee on Cash App. Thank you so much. I'm gonna call Leo tomorrow. He got a quote today for credit repair. He wants to go over his file, so I'm gonna call Leo tomorrow, Jay, because he says he wants to move forward. Okay. All right, so we have uh, Clarissa also says the best thing to do right now is to get your credit up as high as possible, etc. Seven hundred, I mean seven fifty, 750, seven fifties are higher because come twenty twenty one, that's where you will have the most leverage to buy once everything is most affordable. Yeah, no, I, I and we talked, we we've said this back in the podcast when this all started, you know. I commend all the people that are doing it now and positioning themselves rather than playing from behind, you know? Um, and this was before all the money started pumping in from the stimulus and stuff. Cause I think it, it kind of changed people's perspectives and it, and it, and it kind of distracted them. Right. Yes. Um, Cause for a while leading into that, when people didn't know what, you know, that they were going to be getting stimulus money, you saw a lot of people that were focused on that. And a lot of people carried through with it, which I commend. And I think her perspective is absolutely right. Um, you know, if, if you can get your credit looking sharp, they're going to want to lend to you. It doesn't matter. Even if, they, even if there's a contracting GDP, even if there's a contracting economy and the, and the, and the money flow from the banks to the consumers and businesses are contracting. If you're an A plus client, that's who they're going to lend to. Banks only make money by lending money. They're just going to be much pickier in who they're lending to. Right. Yes. Because, because they're going to be lending less money. So as long as everything looks good. Um, and, and, and you're getting your stuff in, in order, then yeah, that's definitely the, the proper, the proper way to position for something. If you believe that, that things are going to play out the way they are. I mean, I, I, you know, I, 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 the way I look at it, I mean, a lot of people look at it with a question mark. I, I mean, when you just look at, if you understand how this stuff works, you understand that without a couple of variables, 
repairing themselves. I mean, there's a, there's a reason why if you ever watch financial shows, the largest concern anybody ever talks about is the fact that unemployment is still bad and it's not yeah. getting better. Continuing claims every week are like a million, million and a half. They've gotten a little better now, like a million too. But they hover around a million. That means a, a million people every single – and this isn't – by the way, just for the record, for anybody that doesn't understand, the unemployment claims that they show on – that they report, right? that doesn't include people that stopped collecting. Okay, so you can only collect unemployment for a certain period of time. After you've scaled out of that system, they don't report you anymore. Mm. So if, if you're somebody that was on unemployment for, I don't know what the limit is on unemployment. I'm not, let's say it's a year, right? Yeah. And they stop, I, I, and they stop saying, look, you can't get, unemployment. that doesn't mean you got a job, but they start, you stop counting against that ratio. Oh, wow. If you're on furlough, you don't count against that ratio. Mm. So it's not really a true number. When you see 11 or 12%, 13, 14%, whatever it is right now, when you see that number, you, that number is compounded exponentially right um in reality so when you start seeing that number get high like even just by normal standards you know that it's bad because in reality it's significantly higher for the reasons i'm explaining right like yeah i i do think she's everything she said is right about wanting to position yourself properly i think being i think being prepared is always the right response okay great that was great <clears throat> so we have uh first gen who says john is preaching the truth i think they are waiting on unemployment refunding to use as a pawn in the election never going to get 600 again maybe 400 next time yeah i don't even i honestly don't think that's happening either but i mean i i don't necessarily disagree with the with with the idea behind negotiating but the problem is that it, it, you know, when you get the Congress has to pass it, Trump already tried to strong arm it and they turned it down. Right. He already tried the executive order, but the executive order still has to get approved. And that was for 300, by the way, federally. And they yeah. shot that down. I, I don't I think the unemployment is done. I think it's done as far as the additional. I don't think that's happening. And the more they see the stock market um, rebound and the 401ks rebound as a result of the propping up and they see these ridiculous numbers, they're not motivated with no motivation. There's no action which is why a stimulus bill that was supposed to be approved two months ago is still languishing. And every day, the press releases get a little less optimistic. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I just don't think, I, I think they're going to, I think they're going to keep a little bit of dry powder because I don't think that they know exactly how we're going to, you know, how they, and they can't, they can't blow their load. Not, this or, They can't use everything now, right? Like I said before, there's two different things. The Fed is one thing, right? The Fed is not who provides the stimulus. The Treasury provides the stimulus. It comes from a totally different scenario. It gets Congress approved our stimulus stuff and all that. It's totally different. The Fed is independent, right? Yes. So they, they're providing money, and they're going to continue to flow that money to corporate America. The the um, All the other stuff, the stimulus money has to get approved. And the Democrats is absolutely, positively, no way if the Republicans, if the Republicans win, that they're going to be motivated at all to make them look better. If the Repu if the Republicans happen to lose, you think that the Republicans are going to vote look better? I think you're going to deal in the same partisan bullshit that led up to it. When there's catastrophe, they figure it out. When you've gotten out of catastrophic levels, you get back to gridlock. And that's where we're at right now. If they wanted to get it done, they would have got it done. Wow. And, and, and the reality is... It, 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 if, if, if we get hit with a second wave and it starts to pressure corporate America again, you'll probably feel the pressure because guess who funds all the political campaigns? Corporate. There you go. And that's where the pressure comes from. Mm. It's not the calls from Main Street to, the, to your local congressman or your councilman that are moving the needle. Correct. You know, that's not what's doing it. So. Well, we have some people here that did the EIDL. Um, one said, two people who are, who are said the same thing. Um, I just called about reconsideration last week, and they told me they do not know when they will have the decision for me. No time frame. That's two people who said that. Clarissa yeah, also mean, said that too. Yeah. So uh, just to give you an idea, what my client the client was describing. He had, you're getting yeah. you're getting cut off a little bit, Jay. 
I said the client that I was talking about earlier in the in the podcast that I gave the example with the guy that owns the insurance claims company in South Florida. He got yeah. the mayor. He he cc the mayor of Miami. I think the governor of Florida. He had to cc all these people and on the email in order to get the response that day because they've they've been calling him. This has been calling over and over and over and over again. And guess who we got on the phone today after doing that? Now, how many people have the ability to do that? Correct. Very small amount. So that's just going to show you, though. I mean, it's becoming a little bit of a tree shaking contest, meaning there's a lot of squirrels trying to get the same nut, and there's only a couple nuts left to get. And and I, you know, that money's running out. So I, I the, what I advised him, and I advise everybody that, that well, there's only two clients of mine that decided to try and do it on their own, and this is what happened. But the fact of the matter is, it's happened, and here's where we're at. But I told them, and I'm. But tell anybody this course, you got to call every day. Find one person that you can identify with over there and just bother the shit out of them. Yeah. They'll eventually take an interest in it because they just want you to leave them alone. Right? Yeah. It's like, it's like you know, subtle harassment 101. It, it, they'll eventually look at it. They'll eventually push it forward. They'll eventually do it, but they're reluctant because, you know, again, you're dealing in a situation where the money is running out. And, you know, if you really need this for your livelihood, that's the only way you're going to be able to get it done before the time runs out and that money runs out. So just keep calling and calling and calling and calling and calling and calling. Okay. You heard that, Clarissa? And um, and who else? Uh, uh, no. Uh, Clarissa and who else? I think. Oh, Andre. Andre Arnold. Andre Arnold. Okay. So we got a lot of amens. Preach on. Uh, Priest John, and then we have Clarissa that says, I love this channel, the most financial informative uh, channel on YouTube, literally. And let me tell you something, uh, Clarissa, when I put John on these podcasts, I said he, he knows too much. And it's good that you guys get some type of education because when you come to us you see we don't only send out credit repair disputes we don't only dispute online we don't only have 99 dollar do it yourself credit repair system because you have to eventually separate yourself from the other people and what they're doing in this business and the one thing about us is that we help people position themselves to do what they want to do with their credit and eventually get that at the best rate with only one inquiry and you have to have a lot of knowledge in order to do that so john is per perfect for these podcasts for for you guys to learn from um so yeah a lot of people are are um you know saying how good you are john uh keep making listen I, I i i love the fact that there's look i i we talked about this before and, I, and i'll say it again i i i'm fine just giving Look, I, I don't know how many people that are listening are actually clients of ours. It doesn't really matter. Correct. I don't know how many people are going to listen to this that are actually clients of ours. It doesn't really matter. We're doing these for the purposes of educating, right? And it gives a little more transparency to um, the people that are interested in starting with us, you know, as far as the depth of the knowledge of the person that's helping you. But more importantly, the, the, the sincerity of the, of the work that's going to be done, right? Yes, everything you said is right. We do position people. We do literally walk them through it and line them up with the lenders. We do all that stuff. And that definitely differentiates us from other companies because most are just one tricks, right? But the fact of the matter is that um, the, the, one of the more rewarding sides of it is, is getting – is the educational side because there's just there's, – there's very little literacy, financial literacy that's taught properly, right? Yes. And it's very difficult to find an avenue of true financial literacy, meaning an area where you can hear what you hear and then that actually be the right answer, especially on social media. So we try for these reasons to do these podcasts so that it, for even if somebody can't afford to do our service, they can still take notes and they can still get the right information. This way they can apply it in their life. And even if you're not a client of ours and you paid us to work on your stuff, but you're still you know, figuring out a way to better your situation because of the knowledge we're giving, I mean, that's a victory. And, yeah. and I mean, that that's the purpose of these, along with just being transparent, trying to be more transparent for the people that do want to work with us. Correct. Fine print on the website. Uh, everybody's talking to one another. This is a good thing, John, is that we have people talking to each other on the chat. So they're not just talking to us. Everybody else is having a conversation on on the chat as well. So, I mean, we're coming up at 8 o'clock uh, right now. Uh, a lot of people just talking to each other on the chat which is great. Uh, Curtis just says Tesla and Apple split bought more. Uh, Tesla and Apple split bought more on Monday. 
and say, I, I, I bought some Apple stock, fat boy. I'm going to sit on it. I'm in it for the long haul. And then Fapos Tesla seems a little speculative. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's an understatement, but I, you know, it's extremely speculative. But I mean, still, I mean, it's it it you know, just be careful with either one of them. You know, I mean, obviously Tesla more than anything. I mean, if anybody ever tracks that stock, I mean, the volatility on that, the beta on that stock, meaning like the 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 level, the the amount that it moves relative to the, the broader market or to the indexes, I mean, is significant. There's so much volatility. I mean, you could see that stock when it was up around before they did the split. I mean, you, you could see it run $200 in a day. Hmm. It's insane, right? I mean, now today it was down, I think 45, 50 bucks, almost 10% in a day. So, I mean, that's a real big move. Even if you're somebody buys a hundred shares, that means you're down five grand, 10 grand in a day. You know, I mean, that's a that's a big number. And for somebody that's just getting their foot in the water and they don't maybe necessarily understand stocks. Correct. You know, you see that kind of move against you and you don't know if it's going to go back up because you're at such lofty levels right now, which is effectively what you are in Tesla. I mean, you're no man's land right now. Correct. And when I say no man's land, I mean, there's so much speculation built into that stock. They've now baked in the China factory, the German factory that – that, that 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 the production in the fourth quarter or the third quarter is going to be the earnings in the fourth quarter are going to be insane. They've now factored in that Tesla is now going to be like this huge battery company. Uh, you know, I mean, there's so much factored in and baked into the price of twenty five hundred dollars a share. Even with that, you'd have to pull forward numbers for like a decade. And when I say pull forward numbers, I just want you guys to understand what I'm saying. That means that you're using revenues based upon three years in advance to validate because the stock market is a discounting mechanism. Meaning you always play in advance. It's not what happens today. What happens today, the market responded to three months ago when they got the rumor on it, right? You always play in advance in the stock market. So effectively today, right right now in Tesla, you're playing on like 2026 numbers, mm. which the normal discounting window for the stock market is like six, nine months. You're out four or five years. Wow. So to draw out that far – you know, you're setting yourself up for something that could be really pop problematic on a pullback scenario. So just be careful, anybody. I mean, the problem is, is that anybody, any kid that comes, you know, that wakes up knows Tesla, right? Because they know Elon Musk. And they're like, yeah, I love Elon Musk. Let's buy the stock. They just don't know the nuances of that particular stock, how volatile it is, mm. how it moves around, where it stands right now, how it even got to that price. I mean, Apple is at pretty lofty levels right now, too. But the fact of the matter is Apple, right? Right. Apple's been around forever. It's got it's constantly coming out with a bevy of stuff. The speculation is not profound within Apple. It's just a multiplier it used to trade at a utility multiplier, and now it trades up around a technology multiplier, which is people have been calling for for years. So you can rationalize that. Yes, you can't rationalize twenty five hundred Tesla. You just can't. Or in this no. case, five hundred. Now it's split. Curtis just says Tesla is up two hundred and ninety six for the year. Turn two hundred and ninety six percent for the year. Yeah. It's Ridiculous. I mean, Ernest, it's, it's... Ernest Dobson said the U6 is more accurate model. The U6, what's that, Jay? I don't know what the U6 is, but I, 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 I it's, it's, it's still not something that, that there's no way to rationalize Tesla $2,500. There's no formula. There's not a formula that exists in society that can get you there in a reasonable period of time. And everybody knows that. If you ever hear anybody talk about, can you explain Tesla? You get the same response. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Then the response we have no idea what's going on with Tesla because you can't, you can't, you can't, you, 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 once you throw out all those formulas that you can normally arrive at to identify value and, and, and it's far beyond that, even on a technical level, it's taken off like a rocket on a technical level. You know what I mean? So, I mean, just be careful. That's all I would say. I mean, there's a lot of stocks that are medium and low beta stocks that aren't as crazy. You know, and, and you're not gonna get torched. I mean, this is this is this. If you buy Tesla and you're like, I'm in it for the long haul, then just don't even look at the screen because you could be have another day like today where it drops 10 percent or it could go up 40 percent. Who knows? Oh, it's crazy. It does, it's it's in such no man's land right now, and it's not tied to anything that nobody can even make sense out of it. Okay, Jay, we are at uh, Apple is steaming with Google to re revolutionize the healthcare sector. That's fab. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. I think that I, yeah, I mean, I think Apple you can rationalize that that number, even though it's up, it's up by itself, some ridiculous amount of number. But you can you can find a rationalization for Apple, right? 
I mean, it, 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 there's so many areas it can expand in. It's, it, 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 and I'm not saying that Tesla doesn't have a lot of people and a lot of followers. It does. But the things that they're trying to speculate into the price have not even started yet. Apple has this base and they're wedging off of existing products that are already in place, right? Yeah. And they're just leaning off of them and they've already proven that they can sell those products. So not that Tesla can. I'm just saying we're up in lofty levels. I think when it was trading at fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars, I mean, you were running at like twenty, twenty-four numbers. So now we're at twenty-five hundred dollars. Well, again, I, I'm not counting the stock split, but as of yesterday, before the split, it was twenty-five hundred dollars a share. So I mean, if you do the math, there's no way to get there. There's no way to get there. So I mean, look, it could go to eight thousand dollars a share. Who knows? If Elon Musk, like I said, I think he's the Thomas Edison of our generation, um, and I think that the young the young generation and and even the the, the 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 millennial generation, you know, I mean, they're just in love with everything he does. So right. this could run on you for mm-hmm. even longer. But there's going to come a time when it comes back to reality. It's just fact, and it will come a time when it when it bases itself off of earnings and ratios, et cetera, that you can actually rationalize. But that I don't think that's coming. That's coming yet. All right, Jay, we had uh, 8.06, which is a great time. Uh, I know you want yeah. to cut off, so that's great. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, John, again. John yeah. uh, answers all of my emails. If you guys are looking for uh, credit repair uh, with us, just email me right here, gizzycredit at gizzycredit.com. Uh, we'll review your file. We're normally looking at Identity IQ or Experian.com. No credit karma, please. Uh, but in the event you're just looking for a quote, want to see what's going on, definitely hit us up. Uh, anything else you want to say, Jay? No, no, I think I covered everything. I think, uh, yeah. And I give us enough. some I ideas of today. what you guys want to talk about next podcast. I know that you guys are these people, they, they like you, Jay. So they're, they're like, man, I, I want to see this guy every week uh, talk. But, um, you know, every other week we're doing these podcasts every Monday. Uh, but definitely I'll have more videos out for you guys, more credit repair results uh, coming this week as well. So just, uh, you know, every other week, I guess it's a special time for you guys uh, uh, to get on live with us and ask us any question or, and learn some more about credit and what's happening. All right, Jay? Uh, you got it. All right, take Peace. care. Thank you. Yep. Okay, mi gente, you already know. Oh, man. That was a lot of stuff, right? A lot of ranting. <laughs> Listen, the topic starts at what? An hour, 15 minutes? <laughs> we like to go into the economy, what's going on. You know, John's in Florida. I'm in New Jersey. So what's going on with the economies in both, you know, in both areas? So definitely, I I, I hope that, you know, you like uh, the podcast in that aspect. And then we go into the topic and really get deep into it. But a lot of things about... um. The experience credit boost that I didn't really uh, know. I didn't really know. Well, you kind of have the the uh, information that, yeah, if you add some accounts, it does go into your credit utilization and to, you know, what you're going to eventually qualify for. So be careful if you are going to use it. But I know many of you now are going to say, hell nah, I ain't going in there. <laughs> Forget that. I don't care if John Cena is the one that uh that's putting the stuff out there. Uh good brain food for the evening. Yes, yes, yes. John's awesome. Uh rest of the day. Yes. So yeah, we're gonna come up with more. Um do it yourself. Um you can bring her out, Tara. Uh we're gonna come up with more uh credit repair results videos. Uh, I know you guys are waiting for the Gizzy Credit theme song. Oh, thank you so much for the for the cafecito money. Hey, listen, Aníbal, he gave us some uh, money for some cafecito. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, anytime we get some cafecito, definitely is worth it. But anyways, you can find me on all the social media networks right up top. Uh, all of you guys want to uh, wait some more. Uh, I enjoy the Financial Topics Weekly Podcast. will be great. I know. Every other week, uh, Carissa. Anyways, bendiciones to all. See you guys later.
it's just a change of plans. 